I'm going to have a fun chance to talk with my dear friend, Dave Gita. He's the art marketing wizard. He can take messages for artists and creatives all around the world and help them optimize their messages in what he calls a, an artist marketing playbook. Just got to check my notes on that. Yeah, Dave, my goodness. So we're going to be talking about marketing and art. And why is that important? Well, on a personal note, I just wanted to share that it took me a long time to get over myself. I know that sounds kind of weird, but yeah, uh, for so many years, I wondered, you know, am I an artist? Um, is it really okay to spend this much money and time on painting? But then, you know, this something inside me kept knocking, knocking, and I finally answered it with the loving support of my husband. And so he just agreed that we're gonna carve out time and, and so it began. And I had no idea this glorious path was gonna then open up for me. So because it's been remarkable for my journey, I just, it's still challenging because I'm still telling myself it's okay to tell your story. Um, I wanna help inspire anyone else listening. If you're not identifying as an artist, I bet you know someone who is, a loved one within the family, a friend who maybe dabbles and loves art, but hasn't taken their message out into the public. So I just wanted to share this little tiny info before Dave joins us on the Ascension Playground. I look at art as a way to naturally bridge um, the soul's longing or yearning to express itself. Never sure what's gonna show up. <laughs> I didn't have a visual in my head before this painting arrived, but um, so be it. It is pretty miraculous when we can get over ourselves, start sharing who we truly are and what we're finding, because the bigger umbrella to share is what's happening today. Anyway, um, I'm going to leave it there, and I'll see you back soon with Dave. Crazy. Secret. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming back, because we're doing another segment of Let's Talk Art. And joining us today is Dave Gita. And Dave has two titles. Let me see if I get this right, Dave. He's CEO of The Art Marketer. And you can find The Art Marketer um, if you Google those three words. He's got his own website. And he's also the chief platform evangelist at FOSSO fine art studios online and that's where i have my website the engine is through fosso so today dave and i are going to continue our discussion about let's talk about art and i'd like to just give a brief overview because i'm so grateful whenever dave has time to join us so here goes the big picture back in like the mid 1970s because dave took us through this all this history, like 500, 600 years, and we move towards this discussion of the sovereign artist. And if you haven't heard our chat, go back and take a peek. But I'm now in the 1970s where here comes the information age. There was a big paradigm shift where it's a new age of media. And in my view as an artist, what that did, not only shift the paradigm, but it gave this huge microphone um, I'll just use my pen, this huge microphone for people who wanted to engage and share on a global level. So it's not just talking to my neighbors, talking to certain cities, or even maybe East Coast, West Coast in the United States. Suddenly we have a microphone that is global through the shift of ages, this new age of media. Secondly, with I'm in present day now, 2022, with all the information happening, and it's like, ah, uh, the age of distraction now, there's so much happening. And unfortunately, in reality, there's a lot of not such pretty stuff, really awful things happening. And this is where enter stage, right? Here comes art. And this idea of how beauty and art and artists can help rebalance a society. Not only rebalance, um, they can also, artists, um, and I'm not saying hobbyists, but artists who are really following their calling and inner calling 
can potentially sometimes be the can share signs of our time. Not only signs of our time, but some artists can even be rather oracular. They can, through their art, whether it's music or painting or sculpture, help guide us as a society and say, where are we going? And now it's no longer society continental, it's global society. So I wanted to give that flavor for how Dave and I are gonna navigate because the third thing I wanted to bring up is with that big microphone and having art and beauty to come rebalance a civilized society, Dave has an easy way for artists who want to start sharing their story. It took me so long to get out of my own way. And so when I knocked on Dave's door to please help me <laughs> and optimize my website, um, he chose me as one of the the lucky 10. And so I have this optimized website. I'm learning internally how to start telling my story from my heart and not being afraid of the critics because I'm starting to get to a point, almost 60, where you go, so what? So what? Not everyone's going to agree. But when you're raised as an Asian female in a military, very uber Catholic family, you're told to just be there, you know, be there, but don't say anything. And who are you to say anything? So I had to get over that. But here we go. We've got now an art marketing playbook program that I'm going to just segue to Dave because as a chief platform evangelist and creator of a, a way for people, creatives, all creatives, who might want to start saying, it's time now. It's time for me to step in and start sharing my story to help balance some of this other stuff that's happening in the world. Like, you know what? We need beauty and art and real life stories now more than ever, more than ever from all ages, all age groups, the young, the middle age, and then there's the elderly. So Dave, that was a lot to drop on you, but welcome, welcome. And thank you for the time you're giving us to learn more about talking about art and marketing. Well, uh, first of all, thank you <laughs> for inviting me back. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and you are a hard act to follow, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to uh, knock it out of the park here. <laughs> uh, before I do, I just wanted to, uh, you know, just let your audience know just how amazing you are. Because uh, not in a very short period of time, you've not only sort of stepped out of your comfort zone and begun to do things you would, would have never thought you'd be doing ever, right? Um, but uh, you're doing it with an eye towards helping others, including other artists. And, um, and, and, and that's really why we're here, right? I mean, if, if you really want to get philosophical for a moment, the purpose of life, I believe, is to uh, impact each other in positive ways uh, and to try to make the world a better place. Uh, you know, that's, that should be everybody's uh, BHAG in terms of their life mission. Uh, we just all go about doing it in different ways. And um, of all the ways I can think of of doing that, to me, art is, uh, you know, one of, one of the most wonderfully amazing ways of doing it. Uh, because, um, you know, there is something, especially about the visual arts, that cuts past all the if I can say this on your show, all the BS, <laughs> and uh, and reaches people at a you know at a very visceral level, uh, and uh, and we've talked about this before, Ursula, but it has to do with uh, basically how the brain works, right? Um, here, here's a crazy here's a crazy bunch, you know pair of facts for you. So um, some of you probably heard that the brain actually processes images. Uh, up to 10,000 times faster than uh, it processes words. Okay. What's even crazier is that the brain is wired to process faces up to 10,000 times faster than it processes images. Okay. And if you do the math, that nets up to a really big number compared to words. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, artists really do, especially visual artists, really do have an opportunity to impact, um, you know, what uh, neuroscientists call uh, cognitive frameworks, okay? So a cognitive framework is, uh, is a fancy word that basically means a way of thinking about 
the world and your place in the world. And we all have a, a cognitive framework from which we work on that's, um, you know, and what underlies our cognitive framework are our beliefs. And, um, and, and beliefs are very, very hard to change, okay? Um, but it's not impossible. And if, uh, if you harken back to that first video, one of the things I shared there was the fact that art throughout the ages, uh, especially visual art, but including all the arts, both, you know, written, uh, music, you know, going into the 20th century film, um, have all led um, societal change and societal change in positive ways, okay? Um, so, you know, having, just, you know, covered the role of artists, I guess the question is, um, you know, what do artists need to do today in order to, you know, to pursue that mission, to have an impact on the world through their art, um, and to leave and to live um, lives of what I call lives of intention, right? Because most of us spend our life basically living it mindlessly, right? Like we drive to work, but we don't really think about driving to work, right? Our minds are churning on other things like, you know, all the horrible things that could happen today at my job, right? Uh, or all the possible horrible things that could happen to my kids given how crazy the world is. Uh, and uh, it's almost like most of us are sleepwalking through life. Uh, and so that is the other power of art is it sort of shakes us from this waking dream and, and makes us live mindful lives, makes us live lives of intention where we're not just coasting through life, doing what we've done in the past without really giving much thought to it, but actually giving thought to, you know, to our, to our actions and the consequences of those actions and what we can do to show up every day and be our best selves. Um, now, the, the challenge obviously is that technology is racing away at this incredibly rapid pace. Um, you mentioned the 1970s earlier, right? Um, and so if you think of, uh, you know, both, you know, you know, the, the entire second half of the 20th century, uh, that was dominated by broadcast television, right? Broadcast television was the very first medium, um, you know, to really unite the world, right? But uh, unfortunately, broadcast medium was not interactive, right? And uh, the keys, right, the gatekeepers of broadcast television um, needed to make money which meant they needed advertisers, which meant that if you wanted to get on your soapbox and reach a global audience, um, you had to, you know, you, you had to have a lot of money to do it, right? Uh, so forget artists at being, every, being able to reach an audience. Um, but here's the funny thing, right? Um, some of the dynamics of broadcast television apply to what we're gonna be talking about today. And I'll give you a wonderful example. It's from, um, it's from a, a, an artwork story that um, I helped develop for uh, another one of the artists in our optimization program, Ursula. Um, yeah, the golden ticket winners. The golden ticket winners. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and so uh, this particular artist, uh, you know, and sometimes when you, when you come across a story, uh, you know, uh, it's it's uh, it's almost like I get goosebumps when I come across a story where uh, the whole story is not being told, right? And you're missing all these wonderful connections and nuances. And so um, part of the process when I do uh, when I optimize an artist's website is um, I work with them to develop five five stories um, related to five of their artworks uh, that are designed to get people to emotionally connect with the art and connect with the artist. And, um, and in that way, over time, you know, eventually get those people to buy from the artist. And so this artist shared the story of, the, of a piece she had created, um, which was uh, this wonderful painting of uh, a Duesenberg. Do you know what a Duesenberg is, Ursula? It's not the blimp. <laughs> No, 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 no. Sorry, that would I'm going to embarrass myself. <laughs> yeah, it's not the Hindenburg. Uh, oh, to be Hindenburg? honest, I didn't know what a Duesenberg <laughs> was till I till I started working with this with this artist. I mean, I sort of did, but you know, you know, you know how facts sometimes go in your head, and then you don't yeah. use them for a while, and then you yeah. forget them. And so this is one of those facts I knew at one time that I forgot. But a Duesenberg is this 
gorgeous car that was manufactured in the 1930s. And you'd recognize it in a heartbeat because one of the you know, signature design elements of uh, a Duesenberg uh, was the fact that the spare tire, which was this gorgeous white wall uh, yeah. with these wonderful spokes in it, um, was clamped to the side of the car. Right? And so uh, this is a vehicle that harkens back to an age before you know, industrialization and mass production uh, sort of bled all of the art and artistry out of manufacturing cars. Before all that happened, you still had these little pockets of manufacturers that were um, designing cars that were really works of art uh, and, and doing so in a very intentional way. Because you know, think about a, a spare tire for a second. Um, it's, it's a very utilitarian piece of equipment and one that we you know, use when, you know, when things aren't really going well in our lives, right? Like if you have a flat tire, right. you're not having a great day, yeah. okay? But the thing about a Duesenberg is that tire and the chrome clamps that hold it to the side and the, you know, and, and the kit that comes to replace the tire are so beautifully designed that it turns this horrible moment into a pleasurable one, right? It's almost like you want to get a flat tire so you can undo those clamps, pull out that beautiful spare tire and put it on your car uh, and, and then drive away. Um, and, uh, and, and it's also a great example of what art does, right? Art can take a moment, which ordinarily is a horrible moment in our lives, and actually turn it into a moment of pure joy and pure wonder, right? Right, that's exactly what I was saying at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Like there's so much horrible perhaps coming across our news channels. How do artists transmute it or offer us another alternative? But that Duesenberg reminds me of signs of our time. It was a sign of that time. Mm -hmm. um, Gosh, Dave, no. I just got to pause for a minute. You're a little bit, I always learn from you, a little bit brain chemistry. So you got your neuroscience down, then you've got the art and you sound like an art historian. So I feel like I'm back in art history classes, but then you <laughs> keep it so real by, you know, this human touch and understanding that, you know what, um, I've looked at all the data. I've got this bigger view and now, you know, it's just helping people um, connect yeah. that with the algorithm. You, it's Dave's yeah. algorithm. Yes. So um, that's very sweet of you to say, but uh, so but I'm going to make this short because I know we're short on time. I just wanted to finish the story because that wasn't the actual oh, there's more. point. Uh, yeah. So uh, the name of this, uh, of this piece, by the way, it's called uh, Despair, D-E-S-P-A-R-E. Right. Wonderful, wonderful name for a painting. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, and um, and so the uh, the artist had written, a, you know, uh, a very short version of the story where she explained how the title of the piece was sort of uh, a play on words on, uh, you know, and, and we've probably all probably all heard this expression, but, uh, you know, the agony of defeat but not defeat as in being defeated, but defeat as in D-E-F-E-E-T, <laughs> right? Uh, and you know me, I'm a curious guy. So when I saw that, I was like, wait, I've, I've got to dig into that and figure out where that comes from, right? Uh, and so I did. And, and, uh, and I don't want to tell the story in reverse, but digging into where that came from led me to the origin, uh, you know, you know, the root origin of the expression that led to this expression, the agony of, you know, defeat, defeat, right? Um, and it turns out that um, if you guys are ancient enough to remember this, because I certainly do, there used to be a television program called ABC's Wild Wor uh, Wide World of Sports. Do you remember it? Mm -hmm. uh, and if you were a sports fan, this is before ESPN, right? Uh, this was a show that Every week, it was hosted by a gentleman by the name of Jim McKay, and, uh, and he would uh, cover uh, sports events, you know, of all types from around the world uh, and talk about, you know, the highs and the lows, yeah? And the intro to, uh, a, to that show uh, was him, uh, you know, basically, you know, saying this intro that he had written that included the expression, the agony of defeat, D-E-F-E-A-T, right? 
Uh, and I encourage you all to just kind of Google ABC Wide World of Sports intro, and you'll see there, there are all sorts of clips. And along with the intro, there's you know, obviously video playing in the background of different sports moments. And one of those moments is, um, you know, is, is actually about a skier uh, whose uh, first name is Vanko. I always butcher his last name, so I'm never, not going to try to, to, to pronounce it. But he was from Slovenia. And if you've ever seen ABC Wild World of Sports, you know there's a part in the intro video where you see the skier coming off the ski jump, right? And as he's coming off the ski jump, he loses control, his arms play out, he starts spinning in the air, and he crashes into the crowd. It was this gentleman, Vanko. And Jim McKay, and this is back in, 19, uh, in 1961 at the Winter Olympics, uh, Jim McKay was, a, was the announcer, the commentator, uh, one of them that was that was there commenting uh, at that event. And that's where he coined the phrase, the agony of defeat. Because what had happened was Vanko had come down the ski jump too fast. And so in order to try to slow down his speed, he lowered his center of gravity. And that's when he lost control, flew into the crowd and ended up with a concussion and a broken ankle. Okay. But here's, here's sort of the bigger picture around that story is that, um, you know, think about it, it's 1961. Television has been around for about a decade, okay? Uh, this was one of the first television broadcasts that was broadcast worldwide. Literally everybody in the world who had a television set saw, saw the show and saw Vanko come off of that. Uh, and so it is literally, I mean, if you wanna be technical about it, uh, it predates the internet, but it is literally the first meme that ever took off, uh, you know, in society. Uh, because for the next 30 years, every generation that watched that show was reminded of it, okay? And so you look at a guy like Vanko and you say to yourself, oh man, what, you know, that poor guy, his life must have been horrible after that, right? Think about it. Think about your ultimate failure being televised through this new medium for the first time and, and everybody knows, everybody knows you screwed up in a really bad way. Um, so you would think his life would have been horrible after that, but no, it was actually um, a very full and fulfilling life. And I believe he's still alive today, uh, but you'll never guess what he's doing. You wanna take a guess? Shoe salesman? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no, we're gonna get to that. We're gonna get to that. It's funny that you, that you say that. No, uh, Vanko uh, returned to Slovenia, returned to his family, and then started pursuing his first love, which was uh, painting landscapes. And he is actually an internationally renowned, internationally uh, celebrated uh, uh, landscape artist. And his work is amazing. And I encourage you all, he actually has an Instagram account, although he hasn't posted there in a while. And he's, I think he's like 72, 73 years old now. Uh, so you got to give the guy a break, but his, wow. his art is up there. You can check it out if you want to check it out. Okay. And, um, and, and, you know, and so that's what I mean by, by you know, like digging into a story and then you find these connections, right? Okay. Right. Uh, now, we fast forward, where did the agony of defeat come from? Okay. Um, it actually comes from, uh, you know, a television show uh, in the 1990s from a fledgling broadcast network. It was the first network to actually ever expand into the US market. And I'm talking, uh, of course, about Fox News. I'm not Fox News, but Fox uh, Television, right? Uh, and the show I'm talking about specifically is a show called Married with Children. Uh, do you remember that show, Ursula? Um, or, I think I was watching Johnny Weissmuller instead. <laughs> <laughs> That's no. funny. <laughs> okay, so, Mary, so, so, you know, uh, so imagine you're a fledgling television station and you're competing against ABS, uh, ABC, NBC, CBS. And so how do you, you know, how do you compete? Well, the way you compete is you've got to find a segment of the U.S. audience that's being underserved, right? And then you serve them. And so, uh, you know, when Fox Finally, because in 1990, they finally sort of hit the stride. They sort of figured out what that group of people were. And they were working class Americans who, if you remember back in 1990, uh, Bush was president, 
he, he had just or was just about to renege on his no new taxes uh, you know, promise. Uh, the U.S. economy was taking a nosedive. It was in a serious recession. And people from all over the world, by the way, I apologize for the background noise. Uh, we have a couple of wonderful dogs that my family is supposed to be keeping in check, and they're doing a lousy job of it. Uh, but they are wonderful dogs, and they bark because they love us. Uh, but in any event, uh, the, uh, the, you know, they, they, they glommed onto, um, you know, this underserved market of folks who, you know, they weren't like, you know, think of some of the other shows that were popular at the time, like, uh, you know, um, The Cosby Show, right? Yeah. Uh, that was popular at the time. Uh, another show that comes to mind is, uh, you, you know, uh, what was that Home Improvement Show? You know, the one about the guy the Waltons, who... Was the Waltons before that? Because no, that was like the 70s. The Waltons oh, were the 70s. Sorry. I'm in the no, wrong... No, this was... This was home, actually, I think the name of the show was Home Improvement, right? Yeah, I was and so it's all about these very successful families, like uh, the Cosby Show. Bill Cosby's, Cosby's character was a doctor. Uh, on the uh, Home Improvement Show, uh, the main character was, uh, you know, uh, ran a cable program. He was the host of a cable program on home repair, right? Uh, and so these, were, these were all like, you know, aspirational, very successful characters on television. And so, you know, Fox was the first to go in a different direction where they were showing, you know, putting together shows about, you know, the everyman, the average person, right? The guy whose life uh, it wasn't so successful, whose life took a horrible turn. And because, you know, because of his tragedy, we get to laugh at it, right? Uh, because it reminds us of our tragedy, right? But man, no matter how bad our life is, that character's life is so much worse. And that was Al Bundy. So Al Bundy's story, he's the main character of Married with Children. And his story is that he was, uh, uh, he was a, uh, basically one of those folks who had peaked very early in life. He was a star quarterback in high school, right? Uh, had all these amazing prospects. And then because of some poor life decisions uh, and just plain stupidity on his part, uh, has to throw that all away. Because uh, basically, he gets his girlfriend pregnant, has to marry her, uh, and then uh, and then ends up being of all things a shoe salesman. <laughs> oh, there you go. There's the shoe. So talk about talk about connections, right? Yeah. And the thing about Al Bundy's life, and and the reason he's such a tragically comic character, is because he's stuck in the past, right? Like he he wants to go back to that time when everybody, you know adulated him, right? And people wanted to hang out with him and they thought he was cool. And, but he's stuck in this life where, you know, he's married to this woman who, you know, he, he resents her so he can't make her happy. So she nags the heck out of him. He's got two rebellious kids that are incredibly disrespectful to him. And he has to go into the mall and sell shoes to women who have, uh, let's just say, uh, outsized expectations about which shoes their feet fit into, okay? Uh, and for him, it's a hard life. And in this episode, The Agony of Defeat, um, he starts having nightmares about feet. And in fact, one of, in one of his nightmares, he wakes up in the middle of the night. He thinks he wakes up in the middle of the night and he rolls over to look at his wife and she's turned into a gigantic foot, right? And, uh, and so, and it's starting to affect his job, right? Because at the end of the day, as, as crappy as his job is, it's all he's got, right? It's the only way he makes money. And, uh, and so uh, this opportunity comes that he thinks might help cure him of his condition, uh, where uh, you know, one of the uh, model of all things uh, in the mall suggests, hey, why don't you hold uh, a beauty pageant? And, and he thinks it's a wonderful idea because he's this lecherous guy who likes to objectify women. It's a nice distraction from the misery of his life. Uh, and so he agrees to it. And of course, it goes horribly, horribly wrong, right? Um, but that, uh, you know, and so the, the title of the episode is The Agony of Defeat, D-E-F-E-E-T. And uh, in etymological terms, that expression came to uh, represent the opposite of what the agony of defeat meant in, in ABC's Wild World of Sports, right? So if the agony of D-E-F-E-A-T was really about, you know, the story of Icarus, right? Flying too close to the sun, right? And then failing horribly, right? Mm -hmm. And in front of everybody. 
and how you dust yourself off and get back up and how we should try to be noble and aspirational. Um, you know, the agony of defeat was sort of the rallying cry for this whole generation of um, folks who were, you know, working at a time when jobs were harder to come by, where wages were going down, where for the first time, it, you know, it felt like their generation was going to be the first generation to do worse than the generation that came before. Um, and, uh, you know, and the worst part of it is that, you know, they're stuck in these horrible dead end jobs that serve other people that are being, that are much more successful than they are. And most, and most of those jobs require you to be on your feet all the time. And the whole time you're doing this job on your feet, um, not only are you underappreciated, but people, you know, barely notice you. And they certainly don't thank you for the work that you do. Right, which is exactly how people were feeling at the time. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I share all of that just, just to, you know, uh, kind of lay out what I'm about to talk about, right? Because it's, it's a perfect example of not only the power of stories, right? Uh, not only how, you know, stories and, and, and terms and expressions and what they mean, um, actually evolve as our cognitive frameworks change over time, right? Given, you know, what's going on around us and the, and the sort of lives that we're, that we're living and how we feel and believe, you know, those lives are going. Um, but, uh, you know, the same techniques that apply in broadcast television, right? Are now available to the average artist. For the first time, you as an artist can directly attract your own audience without having to pay for any advertising. And you can share your stories with those people, develop you know, uh, what to them feels like a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. Um, and through making that connection and building that relationship, you can sell a ton of art yourself. Uh, and here's the crazy part, right? Everything I'm talking about uh, actually takes less time to do when done right. Uh, helps you sell more art than you've ever sold before uh, and gives you more time to do what you love doing the most, which is creating art and impacting, you know, Well, let me segue into your wonderful website because I think, excuse me, here we are. Here's your amazing website. It's called The Art Marketer. So Dave, you know, we've heard this wonderful story from you and it's like signs of the time and now we're in today and here we are welcome to the art marketing playbook program so you you have a real art for taking narrative and knowing how to place perhaps someone's story into a context where it can connect so while i'm on your site where would you like to navigate first should we go to something free the free well site? um before we go anywhere, I just want to say that, um, you know, and it's one of those, so uh, Ursula will bear me out on this, but one of the things I always tell artists is don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough, okay? And because uh, and, that's a common trap that not just artists, but everybody fall into when they're sort of putting themselves out there in this way. Right? And, and by putting themselves out there and being open and honest about their story, they're also being vulnerable, is that we tend to want everything to be exactly perfect. Okay? Uh, the problem with that is that by the time you get things perfect, it's too late. Right? Your market's passed you by. Uh, you run out of ramp in terms of you know, being able to do this thing that you love. Because right? marketing takes time to actually take effect before you start selling. Um, and so I try to be an example of that, you know, by modeling that, that same behavior. So that video, which is on my list of things to replace, yeah. uh, actually harkens back to uh, an older time when we used to talk about um, these concepts in a different way. To, today, the way that we talk about it, the way that I talk about it, is I don't talk about the art marketing playbook program. I talk about the art marketing formula. Because okay. oh. everything that I do in terms of my consulting services, what I teach through uh, um, these free art marketing courses that I, that I do every week, um, is based on this formula that we've developed that really works for artists. Okay? And uh, Inertial just took you to, um, to, to a page where you can take a look at our upcoming 
uh, courses. Uh, and now would actually be a great time to join because we're starting a, a new series on, um, you know, on Facebook. So it's going to cover everything from how to optimize your Facebook business page for art sales all the way through to, um, you know, how to create, uh, um, you know, uh, how to use things like stories and reels and posts um, to actually grow your audience and grow your art sales without actually spending any money, which is kind of cool, right? Yeah. Well, um, there's more. I keep scrolling down. Look at this. Yeah, Look yeah, yeah. So this whole series is going to take us into, uh, you know, into the end of July. My goodness. Uh, and then, uh, and then in August, we're going to be kicking off a series that's going to be all about getting ready for the holiday shopping season. Wow. Right. So we're going to be talking about specific things that you should do. Now, if you guys, um, you know, by the way, these courses are free to attend. Uh, they don't cost you any money. Uh, and, and you can basically kick, click on any of the links uh, that you see uh, up above uh, on just Zoom. sign up with their email yeah. address and a name and you can join. Okay. Uh, well, you can, you, can join our, uh, you can join our email list. And, uh, and when you do that, um, I actually send you invitations to our upcoming courses. Cool. So I'll you'll never miss one. Oh, there you go. Yep. So people and, recognize. Look, you even got a beard and, on your little um, glyph. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's supposed to sort of be me. I guess. Your little logo. Yeah, your yeah, avatar. Logo. My avatar. There you go. My little avatar. Um, now, um, the, the art marketing formula. All right, so let me take a step back and. Uh, and paint a picture of what artists usually experience, right? So uh, most artists get to a point where, you, you know, they, they focus on creating art till they reach a point where they're literally tripping over their art in their studio. And, you, and Ursula, I know you're going through this right now. You know, we're just talking the other day about how you had to, you know, rent some storage space. Art storage. Yeah, to store some of that art that you want to sell. Uh, and then when that happens, what they do is they go, okay, I need to put the art on hold for a while and I need to focus on figuring out how I'm going to market and sell my, sell these things. Uh, and so, you know, they'll go through the usual, you know, sort of checklist items. Right? It's so, not the fun uh, stuff for most people. I mean, I'm telling you, it's a whole no. brain shift, you know, from making art, which is fun and oh, and there's the mm -hmm. adventure. And then you got to go, oh, I can't move around my house anymore. And so, you know, like I didn't even want to go sell Girl Scout cookies, Dave, or my mom would say, go ask the neighbor for some eggs. I'm like, no, I don't want to ask anybody for anything. So this mm -hmm. idea of marketing, there's a part of the brain for some of us, maybe just me, but it's like that's the hard part and you talk to me about it's a gear shift and go back to your brain chemistry it's like okay creative side yeah, so, brain, so yeah so, so, the other side yeah so neuroscientists would call that context switching right context so whenever switching. you go from one task to another task there's overhead involved right uh, your brain literally has to reorganize itself around this new task and depending on how different the tasks are, and let's face it, creating art and marketing and selling art are two very different things. Uh, it takes a while for the brain to reorient itself around this other task. And different and tasks, so, right? Like right side, left side, you know, isn't that? Uh, there actually is no right side, left side. Oh, it's just whole brain, you're doing whole brain. Like that whole, that whole model There's about whole left side, uh, you know, right side. Uh, the brain is much more complicated than that. Okay. Uh, and, and really what you see, um, and, and we know this thanks to advances in technology like MRI technology, where we can actually um, look at blood flow in the brain uh, to detect which areas of the brain are actually okay. firing at any given point in time, right? That's Based on what we're doing. <laughs> and, and what you'll find is that um, the brain uh, is, is composed of these different areas that focus on specific, you know, functions, but it operates a bit like an orchestra, right? So if you think of an orchestra, uh, there are a ton of instruments in your typical orchestra, right? Uh, I, I tried to count one time, uh, and depending on the size of the orchestra, you're talking about anywhere between 50 to 100 different instruments that comprise uh, an orchestra, right? And each of those instruments has a role to play in terms of the composition, the piece that they happen to be playing, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, depending on what movement you're in in the piece, there are certain instruments that are playing 
and some that aren't, some that are playing louder, some that are playing softer. Uh, and, and that continually shifts throughout the composition, right? And that's how you get to music. Uh, but it's through collaboration, all these different instruments working together and doing their part at the right time based on where you are in composition that you experience this wonderful, you know, cacophony of artful noise, right? Well, that, I got a lot of wind inspires, I got wind, yeah. not so many string, but I got a lot yeah. of wind instruments in my brain. Yeah, and, and so the brain is a, is, a, is a lot more complex. And if you were to look at, you know, what's actually going on, uh, you know, in your brain, and uh, you know, when you're doing like creating art versus, uh, say, marketing and selling, you're using uh, very different um, uh, parts of your brain that have to work together, right? And and the two main areas of the brain that you know that are very different that you know that sort of uh, think of, think of it as uh, the areas of the brain that orchestrate this activity, right? They're the orchestrators, right? Um, the written word, the written word uh, and the spoken word uh, operate in different centers of the brain. And so when you're marketing, depending on whether, you know, you're talking to somebody or whether you're putting together, uh, you know, copy for your Instagram post or whatever the case may be, uh, you, it's a different conductor, right? That's sort of like conducting this orchestra. Whereas when you create visual art, it's the visual centers of the brain that take over, right? Oh, wow. I didn't and, or, yeah, really an orchestrating cool. activity. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so that's what I mean by, you know, and what neuroscientists mean by context switching is that your brain literally has to reorganize itself and start activating different areas of your brain in order to do this very different function, okay? And, 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 there's a, and, then, and there's a time, and there's a time that's required to do that. And that's lost time every time you have to do that, okay? Okay, so, so going, back, going back to this whole marketing thing, right? Uh, so what does a typical artist do? Uh, you know, they go through a period of creating art without really kind of focusing on selling it. Uh, then they have to sell it. So the context switch kicks in. Uh, and the first thing they have to do is figure out how to sell it. So they do a bunch of research. And most artists, you know, again, they follow sort of a predictable pattern. Um, one of the things they try to do is they try to find gallery representation, which today is next to impossible, given the fact that uh, so many galleries have shut down. Uh, and the ones that remain are doing really, really well, but they have so many artists to choose from that even when you get into the gallery, you can't count on a steady revenue stream from them because it all really depends on what inventory they put out in the showroom and they change that inventory every week if they know what they're doing. And sometimes yeah. they want exclusivity. So you get the handcuffs and you're not mm -hmm. making any money and you get your yeah. inventory keeps growing and then you need exactly. more storage units. It, it, exactly. Okay, so very quickly artists kind of go, okay, this is not gonna work for me because most of them can't even get into a gallery. And so they do a bunch of research online. Uh, and then what they come across are, and I like to use air quotes here, are digital marketing experts, right? Or online marketing experts. Virtual. And, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and, and, and it's not to knock these experts down, right? Uh, there are some of them that are really, really good and know what they're doing. The problem is that, no, it's not even about money, really. Well, um, they're expensive. It's about, it's about who their advice is for. Oh. Okay. And so one example I like to use is a gentleman by the name of Gary Vanderchuk. Have you ever heard of Gary, Ursula? Vanderchuk. Yeah, yeah. so he, he's a really interesting cat. Um, yeah, really? Uh, he's, his, uh, his company uh, is, uh, you know, it generates, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of about a quarter of a million dollars, and a uh, quarter of a billion dollars in revenue a year. So 250, he's north of $250 million in revenue a year. Um, and, uh, and his whole business model is around helping people become social media influencers, right? And through becoming a social media influencer, then generating revenue by marketing and selling other people's products, okay? And, and that is the most important distinction to remember, right? Is that all these marketing experts that, that you know, we're gonna talk about, including Gary Vanderchuk, um, they're, they're in the business of helping people that don't make anything market and sell other people's products. Wow. And because of that, 
right? Because they're not makers, they're not creators, wow. right? They're, they're salespeople and marketing people at the end of the day, whether you call them social media influencers or SEO experts or whatever you like, you know, whatever expert you want to point to. Um, you know, the advice that they give you is horrible for artists. And, and Gary, I like to use Gary because he's the poster child of this, right? So uh, Gary's pitch is, um, goes something like this. Okay, if you're serious about doing this, this being, being a social media influencer, right? And selling products on, you know, online, you have to be on every social media network, including new ones that are cropping up all the time that nobody's ever heard of. Um, you have to post content on those networks at least 20 times a day. And all of that content has to be unique and different and tailored for each of those platforms, which means that you're going to be working about 16 hours a day, seven days a week for about four or five years before you see a dime. Because that's how long it's going to take you to build an audience up, you know, followers large enough to be interesting to an advertiser who will then want to work with you. Okay, uh, so imagine an artist trying to do that, going, okay, I'm going to take Gary's advice, and many have, and they try to do all this stuff on all these different platforms. Uh, you know, and I've seen artists, you know, you know, do Facebook, do Instagram, do Pinterest, do, uh, you know, uh, Snapchat, do TikTok, I mean, you name it, it's crazy. Uh, and, I, you know, I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to understand what happens to an artist, you know, after doing that for just a couple of weeks. Oh. Like, how would you feel in a couple of weeks? Oh, first of all, think of all the wardrobe changes. Secondly, is it authentic <laughs> to who you are? You know, and, and, and then there's something about, I don't know, being an artist that requires this time of solitude where you turn everything off. So if you're asked to go and be on the other side of the brain, I don't know. There, there's something, I watched that movie, Social Network, and it's like you could see people being coached how to be an influencer. And, but there's a price to pay. There's a price yeah. to pay. Yeah. And I mean, you, like, have to, you, you have to be fake, right? That's what it was. But, but, but you have to be fake in a realistic way, right? Well, and then you like can't you just, buy you all can't, these You robots, can't be right? fake, fake, you get, right? You, so, you pay you know, so, so that all these likes start happening. Yeah, it's like, but, but what's that, real, that, what's not but, real? But that's not the problem, right? the, problem? the problem is that, think about what I just described, right? It's working seven days a week, posting on every social media channel, 20 times a day, unique content, okay? Artists burn out, right? Because many of them- Valley, here, you know, if you're like a young startup, you know, you, you make that commitment. So I'm just saying, I agree with you. However, there is a personality type that ultra type A that they understand, I'm gonna give the next three years, blood, sweat and tears all weekends, 24 seven. And they're yeah. in the garage trying to get to the IPO launch. Well, you know, you know who those people are? No. They're- they tend to be millennials who don't have jobs and are living at home with their parents. Oh no, not in mom's basement. Which, yeah, <laughs> which by the way, is actually Gary Vanderchuk's story. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so no, okay. here, here's how Gary Vanderchuk got I want a life, start. that's not what life is for me. It's like, well, oh he, Well, here's how he got his start. Right, right, here's how he got his start. So um, Gary Vanderchuk is actually from the same neck of the woods that I am, he's a Jersey boy. I'm from Jersey too. And his family owned a local uh, liquor store that specialized in wine. Okay. Oh, yeah. And said. so, and so Gary, you know, was in his early 20s, you know, was, you know, working for his dad, kind of, but, but at the same time, he was super excited about this new technology that had just launched called YouTube. And this was before YouTube got acquired by Google. And, uh, and he was spending a lot of time and, you know, and, and you know how parents are. Parents want you to work in the store and they're like, why are you doing this and whatever? And Gary convinces his dad, dad, I'll tell you what, um, let me see if I can use this YouTube channel to help us sell more wine. And his dad said, yeah, okay. You, you know, but in typical dad fashion, but if it doesn't work, I want you back in the store, right? And so Gary starts putting together these how-to uh, YouTube videos that are all about teaching people about wine, right? 
and you know and what you know and what you should look for in a wine and how you pair wine with different foods and and he would review wines and uh and all the while uh pointing people to his father's store and a new e-commerce website that they had put together where they were selling wine online um the business went through the roof that's a matter of fact at one point his dad said i have no idea what you're doing but okay. keep doing it Okay, so how do you take that great story, because now mm -hmm. I'm remembering it, and how do you put it for artists today? So what would you encourage an artist to do? Say, I've done my okay, painting. So that, well, that, that, that's, what, that's where the formula comes in, okay? okay. Um, be, because um, the trick is, un, you know, is understanding that an artist has to make as well as market and sell their art, right? Um, and so what's required is really focusing on the you know, in, in getting to, you know, be able to focus on the things that really make a difference, that really, uh, you know, there's something called the Pareto principle. Have you ever heard that expression before? Pareto. Sometimes it's called the 80-20 rule. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, uh, and I won't get to the background of, like, where this comes from, because that's a whole other story in and of itself. But long story short is that um, the universe tends to repeat certain mathematical patterns. Nobody knows why, okay? You see this in physics. You see this in uh, you know, you, you see this literally in the world around you. You take a look oh, at a leaf. The universe. Yeah. Yeah you, you, yeah, you take a look at the leaf. And one of one of the examples of this pattern is something called uh, the Fibonacci. Uh, Fibonacci. Uh, hey. Fibonacci, right? Hey. The Fibonacci pattern, um, which shows up in nature all over the place. Okay. Uh, well, there's another pattern that shows up, which is the, the basis of the Pareto principle that, you know, and, and, to focus this on marketing and selling, uh, no matter what product you sell, no matter where you sell it, no matter who you sell it to, no matter how much that product costs, this will always hold true. About 80% of your revenues will come from 20% of your customers. Okay? The other way the pattern holds true is that 80% of your marketing results come from about 20% of the marketing activities that you do. So say that last okay. one again, 80% of your... 80% of your, uh, you know, of the sales that you generate. Okay. Right? Come from 20% of the marketing activities that you, that you do. Okay. Okay. Can you just for a moment, instead of using the word marketing, because some people might like have a wall, um, mm -hmm. you used a term like, um, first of all, get over yourself, tell your story. <laughs> Instead of marketing, yeah, we're, someone we're, fit in something. We're, we're gonna we're gonna get okay. to that in a second because oh, that is a key, okay. that is, a, that is a key part jumped, that yeah. is a key part of all that. But um, but this holds true. Like even any business, including an artist who sells their art, um, they waste a lot of time doing things that really don't, you know, they make you feel good. Right? Oh, I gotta have my cheese and crackers and wine, you know. Right? My, own little, little, my own like, like, party, like for, <laughs> my like own art example. reception for myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like like for example, we're gonna make this a little bit interactive. So those of you okay. watching this video, okay, I want you to uh, you know uh, email both Ursula and me back if this has ever happened to you, okay? Where you set up a Facebook or Instagram account, you followed some marketer's advice, or just got lucky. You find you have, you know, a ton of followers. A ton might be hundreds, might be thousands, might be tens of thousands, but you've never generated any art sales from that audience. Yeah, I got lucky. I have like 2.6 thousand Facebook followers, all mm -hmm. my dearest and dearest friends. <laughs> yes, and how many art sales have you generated from Facebook? Well, I haven't asked anyone to buy Thing. So zero, right? Zero. And most, and most artists, even when they make a sale or two, if you look on the return on investment in terms of the, the time, right, that it took to do that versus what you got in return. Now, Facebook's a bad example because Facebook, when done properly, actually falls into that 20%. Okay. 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 Um, but uh, think about anything else, like trying to chase a gallery down to represent you. Um, or and posting your art on Pinterest, right? Yeah. Or uh, trying the latest SEO fad, okay? These are all examples of things. What's 
social. Uh, SEO stands for search engine optimization. Oh, thank so you. So it's basically yes. all this technical stuff that you do to your website okay. uh, in the hopes that when someone searches, you know, based on certain keywords uh, through a search engine like Google, that your result shows up on the first page, hopefully towards the top. Okay. Um, and, uh, and the thing about SEO is that it's a horrible waste of time for artists because, you know, the SEO experts, right, uh, you know, give you the opposite advice of what you should actually do in order to get results from search engine optimization. Can, right? I, can I ask a quick question then? So like when I have my little YouTube channel, sometimes they get prompted, you want to do an ad. So one time I followed it along to, okay, I want to do an ad and who do you think your audience is? And then I didn't push the button because I, I didn't really understand it. So I just thought, oh, well, <laughs> no. So, so yeah. there's YouTube marketing. There's, so is that a search engine optimization when you are pushed for ads through YouTube? No, that's, that's something called paid search. Paid okay. search, okay. And paid, and paid search is available on platforms like YouTube, okay. right? Uh, but it's basically anytime you're pay you're paying for an ad, right? That places, you know, your your listing, right? Your ad ends up looking a lot like a you know a, a, a natural search result, right? Um, so when, when we talk about SEO, there, there there are two types of things that show up on your page when you type in a search. Uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's Google or Bing or some other search engine. There's uh, you know at the very top, there's usually a bunch of listings that are actually ads. Right, like I people, noticed that. People, they fake you out. You almost well, push the wrong button. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and then there's a section, uh, and depending on the, what you're searching for, of anywhere between, you know, it could be five to about 12 different uh, listings that are, you know, nat you know, natural search results. And what that means is that when Google's technology scans your website, mm -hmm. it it analyzed it uh, based in, you know, based largely on the content that it saw there and other pages linking to your site. And then based on all of that, determined the, the keywords that were the most appropriate for your website. And based on all of that, where you should actually show up, whether that's, wow. you know, on the first page, the second page, the 20th page. Okay. I'm still getting comfortable for that computerized frisking, you know. Yeah. Like every well, well, here, well here's the good news. If you're on FASA, uh, yes, Fine we'll Arts Studio second, Online, um, we take care of all of that for you. Okay. Uh, so you don't have to worry about it. And we do it in a way that actually works for artists. Okay. okay. And so, you know, if you want, maybe on a different segment, we can zero in on something like this and I can explain. I would love that. Uh, yeah, I can explain to you, you know, how, how things how things are different, right? I'm happy to show um, people how to how I've set my, my, I have two websites on FOSSO. And so it'd be fun, it's so simple. If you know how to upload a JPEG basically and choose uh, yeah. a name for a company, like your name and fine art, it's, it's that simple. And I've been with the mm -hmm. company, gosh, now, I wanna say not 20 years, but 16. Yeah, I'm one of the old timers. Uh, you're you're for 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 a young artist. You're uh, you're one of our oldest members. Don't be deceived. I have the <laughs> Zoom enhancement on. There are wrinkles. Yeah, I, I I would too, but I broke the Zoom enhancement, so it does it doesn't work on my face, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, you know, to, to continue along this line, uh, thought here is um, the trick to an artist who's making and marketing and selling is really focusing in on that 20% of marketing that actually works for artists in terms of them growing their art sales and, and then doing it the right way, okay? And, uh, and so the art marketing formula is basically that. It's our proven formula that, you know, that describes what that 20% is and, uh, and also um, how you should go about doing those activities in order to generate art sales yourself in as little time as possible so that, you know, again, you're spending as little time as possible doing marketing mm -hmm. and selling. You're growing your art sales, which sounds counterintuitive, right? right. Uh, and you're spending more time 
actually creating, which is what you love to do the most. It's like, it's like you're targeting. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, a, it's about working smarter, not harder, yeah. right? Now, and it's about... That, did the people get that playbook or that um, algorithm if they sign up from FESO? Because that's not free. Yeah, right? actually, the very first oh. presentation that I ever did when we launched our live courses was um, a live course on this formula. Back then, we called it the playbook. Uh, but uh, today we call it the art market. You could call it a recipe one. book. <laughs> uh, well, it's well. Here's the thing. Here's the thing about it, right? Because yeah. um, here's the other problem with experts and their advice. Okay, um, not only is it not geared for makers of stuff, right? Um, and it's geared for people that just market and sell stuff. Um, it uh, the other problem with it is uh, their approach is tend to be one size fits all solutions, nice. right? So they tell you, this is the way that you have to do it, period, okay? Now, a funny thing happens is that, you know, those, you know, the way they're telling you to do it uh, is something that worked for them and their clients who could be radically different from you, yeah. right? And even if they're so-called art marketing experts, right? Yeah. Uh, their clientele might be in a you know, much different place than you. Right. So, so here's an example of this. I won't name any names, but there's a, a gentleman who's an art marketer out there who's pushing his program uh, around Facebook and Facebook uh, marketing. Right. Uh, and uh, and in, and in all honesty, what he's done is he's taken what other marketing ex experts tell people to do on Facebook, and just you know repackaged it for artists. Okay. Uh, the problem with it is it doesn't work because artists burn out. And, and more importantly, it, you know, it, it, it reinforces this negative, uh, yeah, you've heard me talk about self-defeating narratives, right? Right. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, when I talk about stories and narratives and cognitive frameworks, they're all the same thing, right? Because at the end of the day, what a neuroscientist calls a cognitive framework is basically a story that we tell ourselves about how we believe the world works and how, you know, and, and our role in that world and who, you know, and who we want to show up as or who we think we're showing up as. Right. Uh, and, um, and that sort of colors everything that you do. And just, and just like there are, you know, just like any other tool, a story or a cognitive framework can be a good thing or a bad thing. And when it's a bad thing, we call it a self-defeating narrative. It's a story that you're telling yourself that's getting in the way of your success. Well, in my house, and, we, we call that, excuse me, we call that stinking thinking. Stinking thinking. There you go. I like that. Stinking thinking. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so one of the narratives that, um, self-defeating narratives that gets in the way of artists being successful at marketing and selling their art is the story that marketing and selling is all about lying to people. Or somehow right? it's dirty, yeah. Uh, and, and uh, well, no, think, think about the story that you just shared about an Instagram influencer, right? You're saying how, you know, that you looked into it yourself and you realized that, you know, it's really about being fake, right? And presenting sort of this fake persona to the world. Uh, and and the, face, the look on your face when you were describing that was go back and look at the video yourself and, uh, and your facial expression uh, was exactly, you know, what most artists think of when they think of marketing and selling. Okay. The old, um, the old reason that face was there is the old fashioned ways. I make the art, I bring it to the gallery, they sell it typically. Mm -hmm. and so I don't have the engagement. So when I go to the art receptions and people are looking for the artist, you know, they're not looking for me. They're looking for right. someone they think is going to be, you know, more masculine. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. You know, well, I, it's well, that, that, like, uh, that was certainly your experience at the time, for sure. Yeah, so sometimes uh, part of me then wanted to hide because if they saw this little soft-spoken female, you know, that uh, they wouldn't take the tough work seriously. But this is something yeah. I do that that comes through. So, yeah, but 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 anyway, the 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 reality is that most people, when they think of marketing and selling, think of a used car salesman, right? Or snake oil. The, yeah, or a snake oil salesman, somebody who is, you know, out to get your money, yeah. right, only cares about, you know, getting their money from your pocket to their pocket, and, uh, and doesn't have your own interests at heart, 
And, uh, you know, and the product or service that they're going to sell you is going to end up being subpar in some way. And yeah. there's another belief system, though, that money is bad or money is dirty. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so exactly. keep yourself pure. You know, the starving artist um, paradigm, which that belief system, like, no, no one has to starve. You can be successful. But there, there is that in the, you know, in art school, et cetera. It's this idea that I'm going well, to give up, you know. And I'm yeah, gonna, yeah, it's this notion about, you know, compromise, right? That compromising your ethic, you know, that marketing and selling requires you to compromise your eth your ethics, your morals, your values, right? Even your, your vision, art. even your, your art, art yeah, right? Be I mean, because art at the end of the day is the expression of our, you know, our morals and our beliefs yeah. and uh, and our it's vision. Still art. If it moves towards mm -hmm. illustration, where it's someone else's ideas because you're painting to a market, then it's like. You know. Well, he, here's the funny thing, though, right? A lot of illustrators end up being amazing artists. Oh, yeah. They know and, how to paint. And, and a lot of illustrators, um, and, and there's reasons why, you know, and by illustrators, I'm talking, you know, not illustrators today who tend to be digital, you know, digital artists, right? Everything's digital these days in advertising. But if you think, look back to the 70s and 80s and even the 90s, um, it, you know, they were hand-drawn illustrations, that would make it into Disney. these magazines yeah. and publications. Um, and just like Michelangelo yeah. uh, was subversive in his, in, you know, in his work for the church, some of the most amazing uh, fine artists who came out of illustration were doing the same thing, right? Yeah, they were told to paint, you know, to draw this particular thing for like an advertiser. But if you look very closely at their work, um, you know, as an artist, as someone in the know, you can see where they're introducing them, you know, a part of themselves, right? And being subversive in terms of how they're communicating a message that maybe the, the advertiser doesn't see. Uh, it's sort of like a subliminal message, right? A Da uh, code. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, but go, going back to, you know. I know, we digress. Uh, we do these wonderful tangents, which I love, but I'm sure they drive our audience crazy. Um, but, you know, because most artists believe that story, right? Uh, stories not, you know, not only shape how we view the world, but they also shape our behavior, right? And so when, you know, so if you think that marketing and selling is that, right? Two things are going to happen. One is you're going to avoid it like the plague, right? If you can. Uh, and then if you're forced to do it, you're going to be miserable the whole time you're doing it. And you're going to feel cheap and dirty. And you'll right? prove to yourself that you were right. Yeah. Yeah. That's why, it's a self -fulfilling, you, that's why it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. So, so that type of marketing is selling is what I call bad marketing and selling bad. people who are horrible at marketing and selling right that's what they do okay now let's talk about great marketing and selling okay. great marketing and selling is about putting your audience first right it's about trying to deliver value to them first right uh and and extracting value from them uh, do you think isn't that's even a good on, idea though do you think pardon me? Do you think that's a huge new idea? Putting no, no, that's that's actually been something that's been around, you know, for a lot longer than you think. Well, let's okay. just for an example, Gauguin, when he needed money, he would paint the flowers in a pot, but his real work was over here. John Singer Sargent, same thing. Okay, I'll do mm -hmm. these private commissions of these rich ladies, but then I'm going to get back to my work. But what you're, but I think you're, uh, saying, or Soroya, right? Soroya oh, used to do portraits, Soraya. right, yeah. to pay the bills. Got to pay the right? bills. But I think what um, you're saying is for successful marketing in today's art world, you're putting your audience first. First, you have to know who your audience is. How do you know who your audience is? Well, here's the thing, okay? <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's, it's not about thinking about who your audience is, okay. right? Uh, and, then, and then going after that audience. That's what marketers do, right? Yeah. Marketers break people into little buckets, like right? <laughs> yeah, and they, and they decide which of those buckets they think are going to work best for them, and uh, and and that's where the fakeness starts to bleed in, right? Because then you start thinking about, okay, what do I have to say or do to actually like get these people to do what I want them to do, right? Which is buy something from me. No, no. What you need to start out is by understanding your own story. Okay, 
what you know we this is something that we you know as part of the art marketing formula we call the artist why right the uh, artist and so the why? artist's why why it's not yeah. like julia cameron's the artist. and i actually did a live course on this by the way so it's in our course library if you'd like to check it out For free? but your artist's why is basically um it's the equivalent uh the analogy i like to use is comic books it's the equivalent of a superhero's origin story it's the reason why you became an artist and it's the reason you know why you're the person that you are because those two things are inextricably linked okay and um and and the you know and the interesting interesting thing about it is not all the time but uh you know but most of the time uh you know the artist's why or or, or we use the term artist's why and artist origin story interchangeably right those two are the same thing right um so that origin story is usually um something uh that was an event in your life very early in your life when, by early i mean it could be as young as three up to the age of 10 that was incredibly emotionally charged right whether that whether that was positively or negatively okay I'm flipping me over and, to use um, or flipping us over to the site you helped me figure out because this is exactly what you did for me. Let's see, it's on my mm -hmm. home page. There I am. Here you go. You help take really heady stuff and make it fun. You know, so I well, say that's that's it, sweet. That's sweet of you to say. It's all <laughs> true because I couldn't get over the art spiel and Z. You know, there's a certain way to speak in art and museums mm -hmm. and galleries, but you made me kind of think. Oh yeah, my story was around, hey, can someone loan me a pair of wings to help me fly to school? I always yeah. felt like I was walking close to the spirit. And this is why I went to paint from within. Yeah, and, 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 but here's the funny thing. You and I um, really never got to your artist's why. Oh. And I, and I have a theory of your artist's why. Uh-oh. Well, you want to tell me what, you know what? And I really yeah. I haven't done the five paintings. So I guess I'm not fully optimized yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite yet. We're going to get okay, you there soon. More. We're going to get there soon. Uh, but uh, here's my theory on your artist why, right? Okay. And, 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 to, and to understand why artists struggle with this, um, it's because, you know, because the event was so formative, uh, because the event was, you know, highly emotionally charged, and again, it could either be positively charged or negatively charged, yeah. right? In terms of positive emotions and negative emotions. Um, uh, in, in the case of negative emotions, which is usually the case, it's usually something centered around a negative you know, experience that led to you know, negatively charged emotions that, um, that were frankly quite devastating you know, to you as a person. Um, you, know, uh, you develop these um, coping strategies to deal with it. And one of those coping strategies is art. Okay? Uh, and... Uh, because it was so traumatic, uh, or, or you know, we're so highly emotionally charged, and because it's been drummed into our heads that we shouldn't share our feelings, right? That's that's weakness. That's another self-defeating narrative that's shoved down our throat by Western society. Especially if you're um, part German, you know, I've got yeah, they're yeah. that too, right? Uh, <laughs> let, and forget about being a comedian and being German. That's like a whole different level of you know, tough. Uh, but, uh, no, I, I kid, there are plenty of wonderful right. German comedians. Uh, but, um, but the thing about it is that your, your brain tries to protect you from reliving those past experiences. So most artists who try to figure this out struggle because their, their brain is actually working against them. And by the brain, I mean, the part of our subconscious that's designed to protect us from threats. Right? which is comprised of a number of different areas of the brain. But the two most important ones are the amygdala, which is this little section of your brain, sort of shaped like a peanut, that's deep in your brain. It's an ancient part of our brain that evolved to respond instantaneously to perceived threats before our conscious minds can ever, you know, you know can ever take action. Right? Um, and there's another part called the sympathetic nervous system. Right? So those two areas of the brain are what trigger things like your flight response, your freeze response. Okay? Uh, in this case, what the brain does is it kind of plays a Jedi mind trick on you. 
right? And it goes something like this, like when, it, and I actually work with artists to try to help them figure out their artist why. And, um, and so I'll say, okay, uh, why did you become an artist? And, uh, and so in one case, an artist said to me, well, because I feel this deep connection, you know, to nature. And I said, you realize it's a BS answer, right? That's a non-answer. And the artist went, what do you mean? And I said, that doesn't explain anything, yeah. right? Um, why do you have a deep connection to nature? And then the artist went on to explain, well, when, you know, growing up, we had this house that faced, um, you know, this, you know, this, nat this national park. And so I literally had like a forest behind my house and I love spending time there. And I said, that's still a BS answer. It doesn't explain anything. <laughs> why did you love spending time there? Okay. And she went on to say, well, because whenever I was there, right, I felt, I felt safe and I felt whole and I felt part of like this bigger world, right? And I said, that's still a BS answer. doesn't explain anything. Okay. <laughs> oh, why, you're did you, why did you feel that way? <laughs> right. Oh, man. And so, and so as part of the art marketing formula, we've developed this methodology called the seven whys, right? Uh, and, uh, and basically, uh, the premise of it, as the name would imply, is you keep asking yourself why till you actually get to the real reason why you're an artist. Okay? And so by the end of that process with the artist, and again, at every step in the process, your brain is, without you even realizing it, is trying to uh, take you off the scent. So it's actually, you know, you know, going back to the Star Wars analogy, he's doing a Jedi mind trick and saying, your artist why is because you love nature. Right. And then when you get pushed, it comes up with another Jedi mind trick. Oh, uh, you love nature because it's calming and you feel safe. Uh, and, and so you have to keep asking why and why. And so when I find when we finally got to the root of the reason why, here was the real story. The real story was that this artist's father was an alcoholic. And she had a little sister. And so and she herself at the time was about five or six years old. Her sister was about three or four. And her father, you know, had this really horrible tough job. And the way he coped with it was he, he'd, he'd get drunk after work, wouldn't show up till after dinner time. And then when he did, his, his, you know, her mother and her father would get into a fight and then he'd beat her, he'd beat her up. And if the kids were there, they were next on the list, right? Let alone the trauma of just seeing your father pummeling your mother, right? And so when that would happen, in order to protect her sister and protect herself, she and her sister would run out the back door of their house and run as far into the woods as they could until they couldn't hear the screaming and fighting. Oh my okay? God. And then they would lay down on the, on the you know, on, you know, on, you know, in the undergrowth and they would stare up at the night sky right? And they would hold each other, uh, you know, under a blanket if they were lucky enough to be able to drag a blanket with them. Um, and then they would just look up at the sky until they, they fell asleep. And at some point in the middle of the night, it would get so cold that they'd wake up. And then they'd go back inside the house. And by then, the whole mess was over, okay? Now, if you look at this artist's work, most of her pieces, because guess what? She she chose to live near a national park, right? Uh, no rhyme or reason to it. She doesn't work for the forestry service, right? She could have lived anywhere in the world. Why would she you know, want to live next to a national forest? And if you look at her artwork, her artwork is interesting because most of it is painted from the perspective of laying on the floor, you know, laying in, laying in the uh, underbrush of the forest and looking up through the trees into the sky. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, pretty heavy stuff, right? And here's the thing about your artist's why, is your artist's why, your origin story, explains all the things in life that when you look back on now, you kind of go, uh, you know, like we all have those moments in our life where we go, I have no idea why I did that, right? Uh, and looking back on it now, that was like a stupid thing that I did. But your artist's why now explains why you did that, right? So why would, you know, a woman, uh, you know, move to someplace like 
you know, a national park where it's hard to find jobs and good paying jobs and certainly isn't an, you know, an artist Mecca, right? Like New York or, uh, you know, or the West Coast. Um, and, you know, and then, you know, why, you know, why would you do that, right? Um, and her artist, why explains it, right? Because she wants to be near the place that makes her feel calm and whole, right? And like us, she's dealing with a crazy world. And so, you know, she wants to be near her safe place and be able to go into it whenever she wants in order to renew herself. Why does she paint what she paints? Because by surrounding herself with these images, right, um, she is taking these negative emotions of this event, right, and flipping them around. So, right, so think about that. Think about being a four or five or six or seven year old girl with an alcoholic father who's beating your mom up and you're afraid they're gonna beat you and your little sister up, okay? Um, do you feel like you're in control? Oh. No, quite the opposite, right? Uh, and here's the crazy thing. Um, when you're a little kid, right, you, you typically don't have control of anything, right? Your parents tell you when to eat, when to brush your teeth, what clothes to wear, when to go to school, right? A lot of your life is sort of ordered for you, organized for you by your parents. And it can be frustrating, right? That's why we go through something called the terrible twos, right? Where we're trying to express our individuality. Um, but here, but, you know, but here's a kicker. The thing that gets us through all that is this belief in, in the two underlying pillars of our childhood, which is the fact that we have parents that love and support us. And so when one of those pillars ends up being the thing that's making you feel out of control, you feel even more out of control, right? And, uh, and so here's a funny story. Um, so when she and her sister would go out into the woods, along with, you know, falling asleep, looking at the stars, the other thing that they would do is they, you know, they would bring crayons and paper with them. And they would, and they would color till they fell asleep or till it got too cold to hold the crayons. Um, and so the art, because you know, think, about, think about the tactile experience of drawing, right? Uh, or painting. Uh, but in this case, drawing and with crayons, okay? Um, that piece of paper, that eight and a half, eight by 11 inch sheet of paper, nobody else controls what goes onto that paper but you. You decide what goes on the paper, right? And the crayon, as you're applying it to the paper, right? The tactileness, right? The pressure of drawing the crayon across the, the, the paper um, sort of, seals in, in a visceral way, that feeling of control, okay? Wow. And if you think about the motion, right, of drawing with the crayon, and usually you're going like this, right? Back and forth, back and forth, drawing a line, drawing another line, coloring stuff in, okay? Those repetitive motions, much like knitting, are very calming, right? That's why, for example, with uh, children that are on the autism spectrum, uh, they typically, um, you know, uh, 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 events behaviors called stems. The stem, uh, an example of a stem is very often you'll see uh, a child on the autism spectrum when they get like super anxious, right? Is they'll start rocking back and forth, okay? Uh, another example of a stem is these kids will snap their fingers over and over and over again, okay? But they'll clap over and over and over again. Uh, or they'll spin around in circles over and over and over again until they literally fall on the floor, okay? Um, and uh, these are all repetitive actions that help calm and soothe us, right? And so, and so that coping mechanism of, of coloring and drawing uh, gets wired into our brain at a very early age so that, um, you know, it, it, it's the reason why I call art, you know, the, the wonderful addiction. Right, because if you were to look at the way the brain responds to an artist in, in the process of creating, the same centers of the brain, including the pleasure center, are triggered as if, as in what you would find if someone were taking a drug like heroin or cocaine. The brain responds in the same way, and just like an addiction, 
you know, uh, you suffer the effects of withdrawal when you can't create. Like if you've gone through a, you know, a spell where you couldn't paint, right? I, I call it, I'm jonesing. Yeah, you're jonesing, <laughs> right? Like, and, so, yeah. and so, and so, here's what, and, look, <laughs> and you and I have never talked about this. So I will, you know, I, I, will, uh, I will walk you through the signs and you tell me if I'm wrong or not. First, it starts with irritability, right? We should uh, ask my husband. <laughs> things, yeah, things, things that didn't bother you before suddenly bother you a little bit more, right? Then it, then, uh, it goes from irritability to uh, a change in your behavior towards others, right? Because you're frustrated because you can't do this thing that you love that makes you feel good, right? And so you become short-tempered. Uh, you become harsher in your use of language, right? And you begin to push the people, you know, you know, around you away from you, right? Um, all without realizing that you're doing it, okay? Uh, and then if you have a wonderful spouse like, like you do, right? Okay. They tell you, okay, go back and paint. <laughs> I, can't, I can't live with this version of, yourself, of you. Go and paint. And then when you do, right, in those first few moments, right, it feels amazing, right? It's it is really like the, it's like it's like the essence of pure distilled joy, okay? Uh, and then that feeling begins to to subside, right? Is this the playbook? Is this another playbook? How many playbooks do you yeah. have? Yeah, no, no. This is all part of the formula. What I'm what we're describing here is the underpinning, right? Some of the concepts that underlie the formula. The formula works for two reasons. One, because it's based on science. It's based on the way our brains actually work, and it's based on how collectors specifically actually behave, okay? And it's also based on scientific experimentation, right? So this is a formula that I've developed over eight years of working with artists through, uh, through FASO. Uh, where, uh, and I think I shared this story with you. When I first came to work at FASO, right? Um, again, I'd been in marketing for over 20 years. I, and like any other marketer, I had my toolkit, right? And so, uh, and so sooner or later, somebody found out that there was a marketer at FASO and, and that, art, that artist reached out to me and asked me for advice. And so I gave her some advice. And then she reached out to me a few weeks later and said, your advice stinks. And I went, really? <laughs> Good feedback. Yeah, she goes, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. It, it was too much, right? Uh, and it only took a, a few more times for that to happen for me to realize that I needed to take everything that I knew about marketing and throw it out the window and then actually go and talk to artists, uh, all sorts of artists, artists that were super successful at selling marketing and selling their art themselves, to folks who were kind of eh -eh about it, to, to folks who were just horrible at it. And, uh, and, and look, I'm not a rocket scientist here. I'm not, you know, I'm a part of the Menza organization. I'm never going to win a Nobel Prize for whatever. Um, my sole advantage is that in the role that I have at FASO, I get to talk to a ton of artists about this stuff because that's what they want to talk to me about. Life and when you talk to that many people, you start to see patterns, both in terms of what the successful people are doing and not doing, and the not so successful people are doing and not doing, right? And so once, we, once I teased out those patterns, I began to experiment. This is all open and above board, right? So these are all, you know, like when artists would approach me, I'd say, look, I've got some theories here. I'm not sure they're going to work, but I'm willing to work with you on them, uh, you know, as part of an experiment to see if it does work. And if not, I promise you, I'll, I'll keep experimenting and figuring it out and I will come back to you and, you know, and we'll continue this process if you're open to doing it with me. And a lot of artists were. And, uh, and so this formula that we're talking about is actually the result of over eight years of research and experimentation on what actually works and what doesn't work, right? And not only that, but it's tailored to where you are in your art career. So unlike those other marketing solutions where it's one size fits all, the formula is adaptable. Right? The things we talk about in the formula and the order that you do them in is different depending on whether or not you're first starting out in your art career or, you know, or you've been doing it for 10 or 20 years or you've been doing it for 40 years. Uh, it's different if, you know, if you're 
a working, you know, part-time artist versus a full-time artist versus a master artist, so, right? So let, let's do this for closing. For people who want to figure out how to access that, let me go back to, is it on your website, Dave? Like, is it the sign up with your so, newsletter? Oops, excuse me there. So, so basically, you just have to do one of two things. If you go back to the website and sign up for, register for any of these uh, free uh, art marketing courses, these are live courses, right? We hold them every uh, Wednesday at 11 Central. So that'd be 12 p.m. Eastern, 11 Central, 9 a.m. Pacific. And if you're in some part of the world, uh, I believe it's 4 p.m. GMT every Wednesday. Uh, uh, and so if you register for one of these, you'll, you'll automatically get added to my email list mm -hmm. and you'll get invitations to all the courses that are coming up, you know, and, and we notify you, um, you know, the week of. So you'll get an email invitation that Monday uh, inviting you to the live course that will be happening that Wednesday. Okay. The other option that you have is you can go to the bottom of any page on this website and sign up for uh, to be on my email list. And when you do, you'll get the same invitations. Okay. Oh. Does that include um, your playbook, though? Because I know that was one of those. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, well, you're, you're kind of oh. forcing me to steal my own thunder here for oh. a second. Right? Oh. Uh, but but I'm, happy oh, to do, I'm happy to do that for. I'm happy <laughs> to do that for your audience. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to do an early reveal for your audience. I don't have an issue with that, right? Yeah, but, I'm have um, a fun time. I'm we, we record all of these live courses <laughs> and we make them available to people who are members of uh, FASO, right? So part of your membership with FASO is you get access to my entire course library. Uh, and I've been doing these for almost three years now. And so there's literally a video for just about everything you know, that's a part of the art marketing formula. And, uh, and, we, and also we update that content every year, right? So right now I just finished up, uh, you know, a series on Instagram marketing. That's, you know, it's actually part of the series on, you know, time management, right? So how do you do Instagram in a timely fashion? Uh, and, uh, and that's actually the, I think, fourth series I've done that's uh, you know, in three years, that's been Instagram related because these platforms change all the time, right? So we keep the count, we keep the content fresh. Okay. Um, the thing I was stealing my thunder on is that um, a lot of folks aren't in, you know, in a position to switch their websites right away, right? But they still want access to recordings of the live courses. We also provide transcripts and copies of the presentation and also any resources that we cover, right? So for example, as part of this time management series, um, there's actually something called the, uh, the, uh, uh, the art marketing uh, planning spreadsheet, which is a spreadsheet that, that I developed you know, around the art marketing formula that helps you actually execute marketing and selling of your art in, uh, in a more sustainable fashion, right? So instead, for example, of spending eight hours on a Sunday trying to get all your marketing done in one day, you're actually doing it bit by bit every day uh, and in such a way that it becomes easy to form a habit around it without having to think too much about it, okay? Um, so, so, but again, a lot of artists aren't ready to move their websites. Maybe they have hosting plans. They, they can't, you know, they, they, you know they, they've paid for it for the rest of the year or whatever. Um, and so in a little while here, I'm going to be announcing that we're going to be making the course library available as a subscription service. Right? Oh, uh, so uh, here's the deal. Um, all you need to do is email me at dave at the art marketer.com. Let me know that you're interested in the course, you know, and access to the course library when it becomes available as a subscription service. Uh, and, uh, and I'll put you guys on the early wait list and you'll be the first to be notified when that's available. What a brilliant and amazing gift. Let me tell you, I, and this is not being sweet, Dave, but I'm in your classes and I'm, uh, yes, I'm a F FASO member for a long time, but there's people in the classes that aren't FASO and they get free mm -hmm. access to the classes that you just said on your theartmarketer.com. But here's the thing, so many times in the comment boxes, people will just randomly say, 
this is the best marketing. I haven't paid anything. I've paid for other marketing and it's so mm -hmm. expensive. You keep it real. And I know you like your stories. Okay. So that's, you know, it's Dave and he loves stories, but his stories usually have a very specific message. So you just kind of mm -hmm. go with the flow. But, but, you know, if you're not sure about marketing, just take a listen, drop into one of Dave's classes, sign up if you're interested in being part of the subscription to his library but and or if you decide to change into um, having a new website or you don't have a website really consider FASO Fine Art Studio Online it's the acronym F-A-S-O yeah uh, so, uh, so 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 here's a here's another suggestion for your audience if you know if you're not currently a FASO member register for one of the classes um, join us and when you do one of the things, um, one of the segments I have in, in the uh, in the live course is we, we talk about, you know, you know, the services that we have and, and also special offers. And there's a special offer that we make to people who attend the live courses uh, that, you know, that I will share with you, um, if, you if you show up this Wednesday. Uh, it's a and, really and, great special offer. And, well, it, well it's, it's, we usually offer people a 30-day free trial. Yeah. Uh, but by signing up through the special offer, you'll actually get a 60-day free trial of FASO. Wow. So you can, uh, no commitment. You can build a little quick website, maybe 20 images, test it out, see if you like it. Um, so join and, 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 and there's no credit card required to do a free trial with us. Oh, so I love that. We, don't, we don't do this. Like, you know how these other companies that say, hey, you get a 14-day free trial or a 30-day free trial, but you have to provide your credit card, right? Right. And then, right. And then they hope that you forget to cancel your account. Your so name is not your, Gary. So they Vanderbilt. can hit your credit card, right? Yeah, you're uh, not. You're and, not and, and that's what I call bad marketing, right? That's not good marketing. That's bad marketing. Um, we don't do it that way. So when you sign up for our free trial, you don't need to provide your credit card information up front. The only time you ever have to provide your credit card information is when you want to activate your, your account and become an actual fossil member. And when you do, a ton of amazing things suddenly become accessible to you, right? Wow. And uh, and I'll share just one of them really quickly, right? Um, and, and this is one of my favorite things about FASO. FASO is the only platform that rewards you uh, and helps you promote and market and sell your art simply by keeping your website up to date. And so whenever you upload new art to FASO after you've activated your account, the very next day, we actually take the last piece that you uploaded the day before, and we promote it in a newsletter called the Daily Art Stream, which goes out to 38,000 collectors every day. And when I say collectors, I, I mean honest to gosh collectors, right? Like some people throw the term collector around to mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, somebody smelled like a collector. So I put them on my list, right? Or they walked uh, in and out of the door 10 times. And yeah, exactly. No. So when I say a collector, <laughs> I say it means one of two things. It means someone who we know is actually a collector because they've bought art from one of our artists through the fossil platform. They bought it online. Okay. How many so we know they collect, we know they collect art. Okay. How many? Uh, pardon me? How many, how many collectors? 38,000? 38,000. Yeah. We've, we've wow. been doing this for over 20 years. And in that time, we've amassed an amazing following of collectors, wow. uh, including, um, some very well-known galleries that I won't mention here, uh, who follow, you know, who follow us because we have, you know, some amazing artists that make up, you know, our member, uh, that are part of our, you know, our community, our membership community, um, and uh, and so, you know, when you upload art, it automatically gets promoted in that uh, newsletter, and and FASA works a lot differently than a lot of other platforms you may be familiar with, right? Um, like it's the complete opposite of a site like Fine Art America, right? Uh, in Fine Art America, you pay them money, right? In order to be able to list your art on their platform. Uh, and when they market, they market themselves, okay? Not you. They get people to try to go to Fine Art America and search for art. And just, and, and, and their model is more like a gallery model, right? Uh, because guess who shows up at the top of the search results when people are searching for art? Guess who shows up on their homepage when people are, sh are searching for art? Um, the artists that make the most money for them. 
okay? okay. Uh, and so that doesn't really help most other artists out there. Uh, and, and again, you're, you're, you're paying money and that money is going to promote fine art America, not you specifically, okay? Fossil works completely differently. Your fossil artist website is yours. It's branded to you, not to us, okay? Um, when, you know, when, when we promote your art in that uh, daily art stream newsletter, which by the way, doesn't cost you any money, it's part of your membership. Um, those collectors are encouraged to go and engage with you through your website. They, they're, they're encouraged to go check out your artwork. They're engaged to start a conversation, you know, they're encouraged to start a conversation around your artwork. And they're encouraged to buy your artwork, okay? Uh, and when they do that, they do that from your website. And when you sell original art on Faso, guess who gets to keep all the money? The artists. You do. Yeah. We don't take a percentage of your sales, right? Our whole model is predicated on helping you build your own audience and teaching you and helping you market and sell to that audience so yeah. that, you know, you can live, you live doing what you love to do, okay? And okay. that's just one little teeny tiny example of like a ton of different things that we do behind the scenes. Um, now, one thing I will sort of underscore here, right? Because it's really easy for me to walk away from this part of the conversation uh, without telling you what I, what, I, what I should and what I am going to tell you, which is that uh, although the daily art stream represents you know, the majority of traffic to our artists' websites, even the artists that know what they're doing, right? It tends to be their number one traffic source. It also tends to be a good chunk of their art sales. Um, the goal here is not to make you dependent on that, right? To, to depend on this automated marketing that we do. The way to think about that is it's sort of like um, a defibrillator, right? So if you think of yourself as, you know, doing this marketing and art thing, selling thing, right? Um, you're like a patient who just had a heart attack, yeah. right? Because your marketing engine isn't beating, right? It's, it's not working yet. Flatlining. Okay? It's, and it's flatline. <laughs> and so what is the easiest way to get your heart to start again? Uh, it's with the defibrillator. You shock it, shock right? It. <laughs> and, and so this automated marketing that we do is like that defibrillator. It's meant to get your heart beating again, right? But here's the thing. Um, you don't want to have to use a, a defibrillator every five seconds, right? You don't want it to be the only way that your heart can beat, right? Because that's not going to be fun for you or your art and your chances of survival are going to be very small, right? It's just meant to keep you going until your body, your heart can take over pumping itself again, okay? Uh, and so what, that's what that stuff is designed to do. And so while it's doing that, right? And generating some art sales, you know, for you and bringing money in through the door, we're teaching you and giving you all these tools to help you market and sell your art using, our, using the art marketing formula um, so that your heart begins to beat on its own and independently. And it doesn't have to rely on anyone else but you. So anyway, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it does. I just look at where we've been though. We've been to defeat. <laughs> what was the other one? De 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 tire? <laughs> despair. 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 Oh yeah. Despair. Defeat, despair, yeah. and defibrillator. Defeat, despair. And defibrillator. We've talked about Van Gogh. You got the three Ds with Dave. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, exactly. Thank but you so much. But I yeah, I tend to ramble, but my rambling usually has purpose behind. You got. You got to wait for the wait for the good stuff. Well, if I could just say, if anyone's still listening, um, I would. The reason I chose Faso is. Because because one, I didn't want to pay a designer. And every time I needed to change the images, go back and be codependent with the designer. I'm sorry, I'm just not wired that way. I'm a little cheap. So if I found, I found Faso because it easy, because one, they also pay for your, it includes your HTML code or domain name. I don't even know what I'm talking about, but I didn't have to go get a separate yeah. domain so, name. So, yeah, so, so, yeah. And so, then, bas and then yeah, so basically that. it includes a domain name. Right. So, so even so, even if you have a domain name already, yeah. right, that you got you somewhere can transfer else, it in. you can transfer it over, and you'll never have to pay extra for that again. It's included as part of your membership fee. Okay, so I'm just going to say a number because some people might be wondering how much does this cost. I'm just going to tell you my price. Dave's going to mm -hmm. offer a special price. We, we we're being teased. He won't tell us today, but we're being teased. So annually, for my website, for one website, it's about three hundred dollars, and for me as a business. 
that's not how you, you pay to play. And it's my shingle that I put out in the world and I've been feeding it and I've been updating it. And Dave's helping me to optimize. And, and, for, and, and for those of you who are freaking out at the numbers, because the number is actually $312. Oh, here. excuse me. Well, and it's for our gold membership, which is a membership you really want oh, to be you're on right. if you're, you're, right. if you're serious lower. about marketing and selling. Uh, but uh, And that's the plan I recommend for artists who are serious about this marketing and selling thing, right? Um, you can also pay month to month. Right. There's so a lower the gold, plan, right? yeah, no, no, that gold plan, you can get that same gold plan, but instead of paying for a year up front, oh, right, there, there's a value to paying for a year up front because you get, um, I think something like free. a 20% discount yeah. off of the month to month price. Right. But if, you know, you can't afford to pay $312 now, you can pay $30 a month. Yeah. Which is really for as long for as long as you want. And you think about um, how much a domain name costs people. So it's like, you know, you just subtract. So it, it adds up. It's easy. I, you know, um, you and Clint. You, I'm surprised you didn't mention the other two cool things that you got, right? Oh, the So first of all, you get a, you get branded email, right? Oh, yeah, I get an email. Yeah. So you yeah. can actually, so it comes with, Newsletter. you know, on, on the gold plan, it comes with two email accounts that you can tie to your domain name. And just like Ursula has, oh, and you could be yeah. Ursula at Ursula O'Farrell.com, okay, well, right? Since you brought that up, so here's my site. And thanks mm -hmm. to Dave, I'm going to go back to the first thing you said about faces. See how I'm showing my face? Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. my side of my face. That, that's the, <laughs> that's the side of your face. <laughs> but yeah. there's, there's my side of my other side of my face. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, this is what FASO, um, my website is run on, and it's fantastic because there's a Facebook link and there's mail. Um, I've got, Dave set me up with a lot of different areas to show if you want big paintings, little paintings. Here's something about me. Here's a way to contact me. But um, I, I'm just, I don't really like to talk so much about myself, but it's like it's all here in the kitchen sink, and the wording's been you know, relanguaged so that I'm getting closer to the seven whys. Why does there slip in? Oh, wait, before why? we go, oh, I didn't get a more. chance to tell you your why. Can I tell you your why? Oh, yeah. What, or we could save it for next time if you want to keep it a mystery. get my security blanket out first? No, no, no. Why? No, no, no. Okay. Why well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the hint to your why. Okay. okay. It's something that you said earlier, right? My angel way? Um, nope. No, 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 no. Do uh, you remember when you were talking about, um, you know, the galleries, right? Mm -hmm. And how you didn't like to show up, you know, at galleries because folks were sort of expecting a man. And so when, or when, or when, a woman, when a woman showed up, they were sort of like, you know. Uh, Where's the artist? Pleasantly <laughs> surprised, right? They were unpleasantly surprised, right? Because you, were you weren't what they expected. I don't know. The paintings speak for themselves. They and, stole, and, but. They, they do, they, they do, but that, that's also a self-defeating narrative we'll get to, to another day. But the secret to your artist why is something that you said about your family, right? Mm -hmm. You talked about how you uh, came from a Catholic family, right? Uh, where uh, you were of mixed parentage, right? Uh, your mother uh, is, uh, is, is from where again? China. China. And where's, where's your dad from? Ohio with German oh. immigrants. Ohio, okay, yeah, German country, right? We, we have a German population here in Texas too. Uh, you guys make great bratwurst, by the way, okay? Um, and, so if you, and, and, so, and so if you think about, if you think about that sort of mixture of cultures, right? It's incredibly challenging because in Chinese society, uh, you know, and this is changing, right? But traditionally women are considered, you know, subservient to men. They're second-class citizens. The duty of a woman, of you know, the Chinese woman, is to give her husband sons and raise them, and to do her duty by her husband. I don't like that word duty, Dave. <laughs> yeah, well, it's true. <laughs> it's true. I don't like duty either. <laughs> uh, e either version of the word, right? Uh, especially when it's something that's not freely given but is coerced by society, right? Uh, and they're expected to be silent. Yeah. Right, silent participants oh. in, in life, right? And uh, and then compare that to American culture, right? Where, um, you know, 
uh, you know, in some in some areas of society here in the States, there are some similarities and crossovers. But for the most part, thanks to the feminist movement, um, women are expected to stand up for themselves and to speak their minds, right? And to, and to be equals with their husbands, right? Uh, well, at least that's the story that a lot, you know, that, that women tell themselves. But the reality is that a lot of men still don't believe that, unfortunately, right? Uh, and, uh, and, it's, and it's still a world, especially in the art world, that's largely dominated by men. And if we're being honest with ourselves here, by white men, right? Privileged white men with power, <laughs> right? Uh, and so if you're female uh, and you happen to also, you know, be of, uh, you know, another race, whether that's Chinese or African-American, um, you tend to be marginalized, okay? Uh, and when you fight back on that, there's an enormous inertia back, right? A force pushing back on you to put you back in your place, okay? And, um, and so think about that. Think about being a young girl kind of stuck between these two cultures, right? Where your mom has a set of expectations for you that don't really line up with what you probably really wanted to do in life and where you felt like you didn't have a voice. You didn't have any control, right? But where did you have control? Yeah. You had control over what you put on that piece of paper. And Ooh. so somewhere in your story, uh, is the story, you know, is, is the story of a little girl who, um, who is being coerced into silence. And because she doesn't have a voice, right, because she has no control, she decides to make art her voice, right? And the, and the very act of creating, drawing as a child, soothes you and eases that frustration and tension and lack, and lack of control that you feel, okay? Now, you fast forward to the woman that you are today and all of the important life decisions you've ever made in your life, and you look at it through that lens, and suddenly a lot of those decisions make sense. Like, why didn't I step up and defend myself, right? Why didn't I go up to that collector and give him an earful when he expected a man and not a woman? Why did I remain silent, right? Why do I feel like my art has to speak for me instead of me speaking for my art? Sounds familiar? That's very, that's, I'm going to find my black couch. Where, that's really the, that's, because look at the painting behind me. I mean, these are like mm -hmm. naked ladies. And, um, you know, yeah. in a Catholic yeah. society, you don't show parts. And, and yet, for me, it's this beautiful idea that unclothed, we're all human. And, well, there's kind of suggestions of clothing, but for me. Well, there, there's even a deeper subtext here that you may or may not be aware of. But if you think about the history of the Catholic Church, and by the way, I was raised Catholic as well. Uh, I am non-practicing <laughs> for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and, um, and, the, and, uh, and, if, and if you look at the history of, of the Catholic Church, um, by the way, I, I also happen to be of Spanish descent. Uh, my parents were born in Cuba. My, my grandparents and everybody who came before them came from a region of Spain called Galicia, which is uh, just south of the Pyrenees in Spain. Uh, and, um, and Spain especially uh, has this nasty history around, you know, an oppressive Catholic church, right? And what would the church do? The church would uh, condemn uh, people, especially women, right? Especially women who express sexuality in any form right, as heretics, as witches, and they would burn them at the stake. And as part of that ritual of burning them at the stake, they were declothed, right? They were burned alive, naked, right? Uh -huh. So that everybody could see that, you know, basically it was part psychological torture, right? Because in those societies, being naked was a bad thing, right? Uh, and it was also, uh, you know, to send a message to people that, you know, don't mess with us because if you do, uh, it doesn't matter what you're wearing, it doesn't matter where you are in society, we're gonna find you and we're gonna expose you and then we're gonna burn you alive. Okay? So if you think back to the piece behind you, um, it's, it's, you know, at, at some level, it is playing to that subtext, right? So you've taken 
what was once considered, uh, you know, an you know, anathema, right? This this notion of being naked in front of, you know, the world uh, as punishment, and you've turned it into an act of rebellion. You've turned it into an act of subversion, right? Uh, into an act that that empowers women and gives them a voice as opposed to a punishment that was meant to keep them quiet, to keep them silent, to keep them obedient. Well, we're living in a fascinating time um, where mm -hmm. what used to be quietly hidden perhaps, but you're just supposed to know, um, has now become um, mainstream megaphones of this ridiculousness. And, and so I think that equal and opposite, you talked about the laws, 80-20. <laughs> now it's time to have the, um, the feminine voice step up and say, we're beautiful, mm -hmm. we're collective, um, we all have a place. And from this little black hole, you know, f is from which all of us come and return. And so there's even a broader sense of that, what used to be called degenerate art. This is very Germanic, right? What's degenerate with the Nazis and, and you know, this whole idea of suppression mm -hmm. of the artists. And I started this discussion with you around this idea of signs of our time, Dave. So mm -hmm. yes, we've talked about marketing and what's worked, what hasn't worked. And we get back to the art and the content and where we are today. And I gotta just say, I'm so thankful for heart-based marketers and storytellers and encouragers like yourself, where you're just saying, you know what, we, together we can all help each other. Uh, and I you know I'm gonna try and cut this segment into maybe a couple of parts. Probably like 14 segments at this point. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. But, but uh, well, one other thing about your piece though, before we move on, okay. Um, you notice how the women are arranged in almost a semicircle? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and part of that is composition, right? So you're guiding the eye. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. the other interesting thing about the composition, right, is that, okay. uh, again, our brains are wired for faces, right? So we look for them, even hints of them. Yeah. And, we, and, and because we live in Western civilization, whenever we're scanning anything, we scan from left to right, top to bottom, okay? So where's my eye initially drawn in this composition, right? Uh, by the way, we also tend to focus on light versus darkness, Right. Right. right, we move away from darkness and towards the light. So in actuality, what my eye first looks at, right? Because uh, the other thing that we do, just like an artist does, is you know we look at patterns in terms of shapes that we see before us, right? And so my eye, and I think most people's eye, are naturally drawn to the upper left corner of the piece because it's one of the lightest, right? And it's diametrically opposed on both corners to the darkest parts of the canvas. And then I, we immediately kind of go from left to right to that partially obscured face that you see, right? And then we begin to trace a line down and across the circle to all the other faces, right? And as we're doing that, um, you know, the you know, your use of light colors and dark colors in that right upper corner you know, causes our eye to continue that circular pattern, right? Until we come back again, and then we go back around the circle again, okay? Yeah. Now, here's what's interesting about the I subtext a little bit about, more. about that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And here's what's interesting about the subtext of all of that, right? Um, remember what I said about the Catholic Church, especially during the Inquisition, and obviously during the Middle Ages, and, and in Salem, Massachusetts, as early as Salem, Massachusetts, um, you know, you know, uh, women, uh, especially, you know, women that didn't conform were branded as witches and burned at the stake. Okay. And the term, uh, you know, they, they call you a witch, but really, uh, witches were believed to be part of covens, right? It wasn't just one witch, right? Where there was one witch, there were a number of different witches, right? And, uh, and the traditional iconography around a witch's cavern is a big black pot, right? With boiling, bubbling stuff in the middle and a circle of witches <laughs> around it casting a spell, okay? So what's in the center of your circle? <laughs> I thought it was a super galactic center, but it looks like... No, no, it's a witch's cauldron. Okay, okay? This, this could and, be and this is, and, and, and the, and, 
And, this, and so you have these women oriented around this dark area, which is the witch's cauldron. But again, here's what's subversive about it, right? When witches, you know, in this iconography, when witches are circling the cauldron and casting a spell, where are they facing? Oh, I thought they would face inward, but... I inward, exactly, okay? Your women are doing the exact opposite, right? They're facing outward, not inward. Here's my two. They're facing, they're facing away from the darkness, yeah. right? From, and again, the whole notion of a cauldron that's boiling and casting evil spells, uh, you, know, it, you know, there's a whole series we could do on union psychology and the psychology of symbols. Uh, but uh, you know, that represents uh, negativity, right? Negative behavior, negative energy, energy that hurts life, doesn't, doesn't impart or help life, okay? And so instead of facing that, in being focused on harm, the women in your painting are facing outward, right? They're denying the darkness, right? And they're embracing the world around them and seeking to heal, not to harm. Hmm. Guess what and, the title is? And, and, what was that? Guess what the title is? Uh, I have no idea, but I'm excited to hear what it is. It's, it's not a defoot or defeat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad. Uh, de witch. Is it yeah. de witch? No. <laughs> de witch. De witch. De witch. For those, <laughs> those of you who are Fantasy Island fans. <laughs> um, it, it was done in 2013. It's called New mm -hmm. Beginnings. And it's this idea of shifting away from, um, it's exactly turning like Plato's cave towards the light. And, and, and I don't know. I just, these things come through me, but I do own this idea. Oh, but, but I'm under, very but, nervous yeah. about that word witch, though. It's something that I have learned how to hold because a witch was actually a very wise woman and hold, could hold sacred yeah. trees that tie to the earth and the wisdom. And there's so many men at that time were so afraid of the woman being strong in herself and knowingness, especially with healing modalities, mm -hmm. that they would you know, burn them. Yeah. And so, so, so where does that come from? Do you know? Uh, well, we're going to go back to Genesis? <laughs> no, not back to Genesis. We don't have to go to the Bible. Um, it, has, it actually has to do with paganism. Uh, many pagan societies, especially in places like Britannia and Germania, uh, you know, basically Western Europe, uh, were matriarchies. Right, yes, where, Amazon, where the ones yeah. who held power were women, yeah, and those women um, held power. Uh, you know, their power was rooted in, you know, in magic tied to the land. Right, they were seers and healers, okay? and yeah, so when Christianity that. first started to move oh. into this area of the world, when you had your first, uh, you know, your your first, uh, you know. Uh, no, I almost said monasteries. That's not what, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, where, I can't, I'm drawing a blank. What are those people that go around trying to convert people? Called? Missionaries. Missionaries, thank you. When the first missionaries went into Britannia, um, you know, it, they were shocked to find that these barbarians were being led by women. And that, and that they didn't worship one god, they worshiped many gods. And that they actually believe that witchcraft was a good thing, right? Uh, because the whole notion of witchcraft and, and witchery and spellcraft um, is rooted in the feminine, right? Uh, yeah, because the all of that is tied to is tied to the empathic, right? Which is considered to be a feminine trait. The opposite right? of the solar male. It's the the, uh, yeah, the opposite of you know, you know, mo a monotheistic. Uh, religion, where the God is solely represented as a male figure, okay, and, uh, and where men dominate society, women don't. And so those women who were deified in their own cultures, right, revered, right, um, that whole, you know, notion was subverted by the missionaries, by the early church leaders, right, who would walk in and say, no, no, you've got this all wrong. There's only one God, Okay? And you shouldn't be listening to what a woman says because it was women that got us in trouble in the first place, right? And so these women that you revere, 
right, for their empathy and for their ability to see, that is all evil and sinful, and they need to be burned at the stake if you ever want to have a hope and heck of making it to heaven. This was a really and as they took over that area of the world, that's exactly what they did. And then those traditions, you know, came over, uh, you know, to, to the early Americas, uh, because a lot of, you know, you know, a lot of the first settlers here were Puritans, right? Who right. believed in I a strict that. monotheistic code, oh. okay? And, and all you need to do is add a little bit of magic mushroom to, because you realize that, there are actually people? anthropologists who, uh, and this is a sound theory, this is actually a theory based on science, who believe that all of the witch trials in Salem and all that insanity was due to a fungus that grew in the potato crop that the Puritans were raising in the Americas uh, that, had psych that had psychedelic effects. And so these people were eating these, these magic potatoes that had the fungus on them, uh, and, and they were basically tripping. And those trips were sort of internalized, again, conceptual frameworks, right? Uh, into, oh, I'm seeing this crazy stuff because she's a witch. And I didn't like her anyway, <laughs> right? Uh, she's not, you know, uh, you know she, she's not a normal woman, right? Like she tends to speak her mind. But that's not what a woman's supposed to do, right? Oh, um, having the shift. And, yeah, and so, um, and so I point all this out to say that, um, you know, whether we mean to or not, okay, so one of the things that drives me the craziest is when an, uh, an artist says that my process is to just go with the flow, right? I paint whatever I want, I paint, you know, whatever subject I want to paint or whatever. Um, that couldn't be farther from the truth. We are all, you know, rooted in the continuation of history, of the lives that came before us, okay? When we talk about, when we talk about interconnectedness, we tend to talk about interconnectedness in terms of our own time, right? And the people that we live with now. But we are literally interconnected across time to the very first homo sapien that walked the earth. Okay? You're getting a little woo-woo on me, Dave. No, I'm not. That doesn't I'm sound not. Very scientific. Be because no, this is this is this is incredibly scientific, right? Because again, the way that we the way that we perceive and we think of the world, right, and these cognitive frameworks that we create are are narratives that themselves are layered on other narratives and respond and, and are a response to previous narratives, going all the way back through the history of time. Much like art, right? Every new you know, movement in art is a reaction and, and the opposite of the movement that came before it. It's a response to it, right? It's a response to its constraints, right? And its limitations. Yeah. And, um, and so when we think that we're just out there kind of like letting the muse guide us, really? Yeah. Um, own, own, own what, what you're, what's coming through you. I got well, well, it's not, I'm not saying that it's an invalid way of creating art. What I'm saying is recognize it for what it is, right? Which is a way of putting your conscious mind to the side mm -hmm. and tapping into this, his, this connected history of narrative, right? To subvert, you know, you know, these stories that are self-defeating stories that are getting in the way, not only of our success, but the sex, success of whole segments of society. Well, and, and that's what you've done in this piece. Well, right? I got to say, you, you've, you lit the match for me. Uh, you defibrillated me because one of my big buttons my big, is, you know what? Yeah. I'm going to get closer to the screen. What the heck? Um, with so many thousands of artists, most of them who paint are women. We don't have the micro. We haven't given ourselves permission to speak that there's another way to paint. And it's not from a male perspective that relies on all this incredibly mostly male oriented art. There's another way to show up, just like you were saying with the witchcraft. Okay, I gotta get over that witch word, but it's if on a metaphor, it's like Carl, um, it's like Joseph Campbell saying, here is the solar Christ, Jesus, the 
the icon for the last 2000 years. But in our dreaming, the opposite comes through collectively around the globe. And what is that? That is the black Madonna. It is the feminine, the opposite. So, so too with your universal laws of, you know, cause and effect, this idea of the time of the black Madonna speaking and, and claiming her place goes to your idea of the sovereign artist. And so I'm gonna challenge anyone listening for speaking engagements. We need to start focusing on, on how do women communicate and own their art and their work and stop hiding. And I'm telling myself the same thing because I think, oh, I'm gonna step aside from that witch word, but you nailed it. I, I know about I the cauldron, I'd like to say the super galactic center, but, but this idea of playing with our fuller humanity and what does that feel like in this era of all the genders being up for conversation, but something deeper is going on and that is legitimacy. It's like, we decide who we are as a country, we decide who we are as an individual. So where is it for these wonderful art platforms to start allowing women to say, how do you show up in painting? I'm not talking quilting and crocheting, Okay, I'm not talking domestic baking and cooking. No, real balls to the wall, boobs to the wall, feminine painting that doesn't counter kill the masculine, but says, I belong here too. Facing yeah, out. I, I, th I, think, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? Because at the end of the what, day. With the boobs to the wall? <laughs> no, 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 I'm gonna no, edit no, that no, no, you, you, no, no, you don't, no, you don't. Um, you know, so that, that is, that is, well, that is, that is sort of, I'm the sick beauty, of the, the same well, that, old that's sort of, well, that's the, that's the beauty of feminist movements dating back as far as, um, you know, if you want to talk about feminist movements and one of the earliest ones, you, bring uh, back you can go all the way back to Greek history and, and the Amazons, yeah. right? Well, unfortunately, you got, you got unfortunately, the, unfortunately, the Amazons were, were not, you know, uh, that they were an example of, of uh, usurping the masculine, right? By becoming the masculine uh, and not honoring the feminine. But I think you hit it the nail on the head when you talked about parody, right? The, he, the goal here is to strike balance, right? Yeah. Because um, there, there's a wonderful uh, Hindu uh, uh, parable, the fable that I'll share with you that has uh, served me very well personally and uh, has helped the people that, you know, that I've shared this with. Uh, and, it's the, uh, and it's the story of the prince who brings an elephant before the three wisest men in his kingdom. Have you heard this one before? I haven't heard it the way you say it though. Yeah, all right, well, well, I'll give you the Dave version. So this prince, you know, who's a pretty clever guy uh, and is soon to become the king, uh, brings an elephant before the, the three wisest men in the kingdom, you know, his father's advisors, as sort of a test, right, uh, to decide whether or not he wants to use them as his advisors. And, uh, and because they're blind, he brings the elephant up, but he doesn't tell them that it's an elephant. And he asks them each to describe what he's brought before them. And so the first blind man grabs the elephant's trunk and then immediately says, oh, I know exactly what this is. This is a tree, and I know that because I just grabbed one of its limbs. The second blind man reaches up and feels the elephant's belly and its legs, and he says, no, 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 this is obviously not a tree. It's a hut because I found the doorway. And the third blind man grabs the elephant's tail and says, you are both fools because this is plainly a snake, and I've got it by the tail. Okay, now. If you think about that, from each of their subjective pers you know, perspectives, they were right, but so very wrong, right? It's not until you, you take all of those perspectives together into account, right? You weave them into one cohesive cognitive framework or narrative that you realize that the truth is actually something quite different. That it's actually an elephant and not a tree and not a hut and not a snake. I love that. I love how you said it. But guess mm -hmm. what? The new version, can I just say, there was another person there. There was a woman who could see, and she was the one cleaning up after the, the elephant's dung. So 
but she really could see what was the reality of it. And that's what we're mm -hmm. talking about, the balancing of, we all see different pieces, but we haven't given well, can I, yeah, can to I, the can woman I with a, the yeah, elephant can I, let, can, I, can, I, can I let you in on a little secret? Sure. Okay. Um, that's her red herring. Right? A red herring about yeah. the woman who could see? Yeah. Picking up yeah. The yeah, because the woman <laughs> uh, couldn't really see. <laughs> Because the, the actual truth behind that, that whole parable is that uh, you can't believe your eyes. Right? And so, male, and so the, the elephant, and so <laughs> the, the males were definitely wrong, but she was wrong too, right? Because there was more that. going on there than that, than that creature being an elephant, right? Because when we think of an elephant, what do we think of? Well, she was looking at it from the inside. We were, out. Well, she was looking at it as this the out, the out. dumb, an, dumb animal whose poop I have to pick up, right? But it's a creature. Place, it's subservient. It's a, well, it's subservient to man, right? It's a service animal. Okay. The reality of what an elephant actually is uh, is actually much different. Elephants' brains work much like our brains work. They have incredible memories. They form very close-knit families and emotional bonds. Again, it, they're a matriarchy, right? It's the female elephant that, you know, that in the females within the herd that actually manage the herd, okay? And there are accounts of elephants um, remembering kindnesses done to them, yeah. and then re years later repaying those people yeah. by saving their lives. Amazing. Or oh, remembering where they were born and thank you. Or remembering where they were born so they or remembering where they need to go to die. Right. Uh, like, like if you think about it, the notion of an elephant's graveyard, okay, um, that is not an act, a behavior of a dumb animal. Right. Okay? I know. That's the behavior of an animal that understands, you know, like we do, that we live in a present. There's most definitely a past, and there's most definitely a future, and at the at the end of that future, I'm going to die. Right? So how could you call a creature like that dumb? Right. It's not. And yet the prince couldn't see that. The woman couldn't see that. The white the blind wise men definitely couldn't see that. And that's really the underlying message of that parable: is that in order to truly see, you have to strip away all your preconceptions. You have to strip away your ego. You have to be willing to view the world through many lenses. And one of my, one of my favorite Buddhist, you know, uh, you know, teachings, sayings, is that, um, and by the guess, I'm not a Buddhist, but I, I am fascinated by, by religion, right? Because religion is one of the ways that we try through narrative to make sense of the world. And, uh, and so the, there's that, you know, teaching uh, in Buddhism that says that the, you know, uh, the way into the house of God, there are many ways into the house of God. You can go in through the door, you can go in through the window, you can go down the chimney, right? There's more than one path to reaching enlightenment and, you know, and, and, and becoming one with the eternal. Uh, and, um, and it's true. But in order to do that, you have to be willing, you know, much like in Joseph Campbell's, you know, uh, teachings, you have to be willing to kill yourself, metaphorically. Yeah, you have to be willing to give up the person that you are today to become the hero of your own story, right? Right. And, um, and then that brings us, speaking of witches circles and circles in general, that brings us full circle because really uh, that's, you know, if, if the formula is a scientific method, you know, it also has a heart, right? It also has, um, you know, uh, sort of a guiding principle based on um, you know, notions of morality and spirituality and connectedness, okay? And the heart of that is that, um, you know, we have to shed the self-defeating narratives that hold us back. The stories that others force upon us or that we tell ourselves, um, that get in the way of us having the impact that we want to have on the world and on others and of making the world a better place.
And so you asked earlier, how do we as women right, do this? Uh, and it's by doing what you've been doing, which hasn't been easy. <laughs> Giving up those self-defeating narratives, right? Like a year ago, would you thought, would you ever have thought that you'd be, you know, doing, you know, putting together YouTube videos? No, I would just, I just would have these grimaces or like, I'm so sick of the same old, same old, but I hadn't engaged. And, and so I put it upon myself. Well, if you're unhappy about something, what's the solution? And so I'm going to encourage myself, thanks to you, uh, defibrillating mm -hmm. me, uh, that um, I'm really about like, hey, let's get our our whole collective together. It's it's about mm -hmm. the diversity. It's not about the singularity and it's a collective. And it, it is a balancing of masculine, feminine and everything mm -hmm. in between because it's and, like- and, on, and, here's a, and, here's the, and here's the irony here, right? Yeah. That in order to do all this, you need to in play. order to have this impact that you're having on the world, mm -hmm. you are slowly killing your old self. I'm that shedding. old self that I'm was told for years. No, you're, you're literally dying. You're killing it, right? Uh, and rightly so. Well, every uh, seven years we have different cells, right? So we really do have a new body every seven years. Did you know that, uh, <laughs> Greg Braden? Huh? Yeah. Science. And by the way, when I say killing yourself, uh, I, I, I don't mean that literally. Uh, no, I know. Neither, neither does Joseph Campbell. But you know, in in the hero's journey, uh, the hero has to, in the story sometimes literally dies, more often metaphorically dies, yeah, right? the old uh, in order to become the hero they were meant to be by the end of the yeah. story, right? Exactly. And, you're, and you're in that process right now, right? For how you long, for so how many fast. years have you been I told, know. don't you know, be so quiet, fast. be quiet and look pretty. I know, right? Right, right? No. And, and look, and, and, uh, and I also understand the irony within the irony here. Right, because you know some people may look at this as just another example of mansplaining, right? Like, who is this guy, Dave, to explain to us the feminine? Right. Well, I don't think you're doing that. I think what you're doing is saying, um, get to know that microphone, and here's here's a here's an algorithm, here's a playbook that you're willing to offer free classes. Um, free mm -hmm. newsletter, and even a special offer if anyone's interested in um, a fine art studio online new website. Yeah, but is that, is that really what I'm offering? No, you're offering the mirror. You're like the mirror ball. What do you see when you see in the mirror? Oh, well, I only paint because um, it feels good. <laughs> or I don't know. No, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll tell you in, in very simple terms. I am offering transformation and self-actualization as an artist. That's what I do. Okay? You are radical. Yeah, I mean, these things that you talk about yeah. are the mechanics of how I do it, right? Can you uh, say that again? Because I want to make sure everyone- Yeah, it, it's, it's, I offer transformation and self-actualization for artists. Hmm. That's what I do. That and is my mission. You're kind of covert about it because I send you copy and then you kind of give your Dave um, magic to it. And it seems so human and, and it mm -hmm. rings for me like a bell, like, oh, that was simple. How come I didn't see it? <laughs> but it's making it conscious here first. So you're right. It's a journey. Oh, we're on the mm -hmm. Dave ship going through the hero's journey. No, it's, it's, no, it's not the Dave ship because you got it wrong. Yeah. Okay, okay. Go back to your Joseph Campbell. Uh, okay. The solar uh, Christ so, and the Black Madonna. So, no, no. Who's the hero of the story? I am. Yeah. And I who am I? You're that annoying little creature on the side. I, I don't know. Let's see. Hmm. What are you? Okay. So what are, what, okay. So uh, according to, you know, Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey, um, you, you, you know, first of all, you're, uh, in terms of narrative structure, your story has to have a beginning, a middle and an end, right? Right. Okay. And at the beginning of your story, uh, you have a hero who's not the hero yet. Right. Uh, but by the end of the story, by overcoming challenges, by overcoming a villain. Uh, and those villains typically are symbols for abstract challenges that we have to overcome. You become the hero, right? And along that way to become the hero, 
the person you were at the beginning of the story has to die, right? In order for you to become this new person, right? Which is really you, but your best, the best version of you, okay? Um, obviously you need to have a villain, right? Uh, something that is standing in the way of the hero becoming the hero, okay? That's true. The other thing your story needs is a guide, and sometimes more than one guide, right? And the guide is the character that uh, has been there, done that, is familiar with their hero's journey because they've gone through it themselves, and, uh, and, is, the, and, and is guiding the hero on this path. Right? and ensuring that they make it out the other end, uh, you know, the hero, and, and, and fully self-actualized, right? They're, they're, sort of the, they're sort of the ones helping steer the transformational process to ensure its success. Okay? So I was a and, little bit right when I so, said for the elephant, you know, because, you know, Ganesh, you could hold on to the tail and be guide. You're the guide. So uh, I'm I'm the guide, but not guide. but I'm not guiding you by hanging on to the elephant's tail, right? <laughs> what what I'm doing, you know, through what I teach and the services that I offer, is um, you know, the best way that I can describe this is by using a movie example. Okay, and so those of you, you know, you hopefully you'll come to know me, and when you come to know me, you'll know that. Um, I love stories, and one of my favorite genres of stories for a variety of different reasons is science fiction, right? Because I am the type of person who, um, you know, who's always about the future, right? And, and, and I love nothing more than envisioning the future and its possibilities and, and making those futures a reality uh, and, and making those realities the best version of those realities that I possibly can. That's what, that's what gives me joy in life, okay? Uh, and, uh, and so uh, I watch a lot of science fiction movies, and one of my favorite all-time science fiction movies is the first Matrix movie, okay? And so if, if you look at that movie, who's the hero in, in that story? Who's not the hero in the beginning? Right. Um, Canel Reeves. Um, Uno? Yeah. Neo. Neo. Okay, right. so I got it. Who, 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 isn't, who isn't even really like Neo? His his real name given to him by the system is John Smith. That's right. Or oh no, or Anderson, Mr. Okay. Anderson, right? Uh, and you know Neo is his hacker name, right? Um, and in the beginning of the story, he's not the hero, right? Uh, it's not until the end of the story. Mm -hmm where he literally dies, right? At the end of the matrix, he gets shot by Agent Smith. Oh, right before he can escape, right? And his heart stops and he's in the physical world, he's literally dead, okay? Uh, and, and he's just in those moments, right? Because everybody here probably knows that, you know, when you die, the human brain actually continues on for anywhere between three to five minutes, right? It's still active. And so, you know, uh, what resurrects Neo? Do you remember? A kiss from his girlfriend? No, well, the, the kiss Wrong was movie. a nice. The, the kiss was a nice touch. <laughs> right? But uh, there's a character in the movie called Trinity, oh, right? Yeah. And and Trinity is one of these guide figures. She's not the main guide, um, but the the Oracle, right? Who's this? And for those of you who've not seen The Matrix, uh, I'll try not to give you too many spoilers, but the Oracle is this computer program that, um, that through heuristics and sort of an intuitive uh, algorithm can uh, predict the future. Okay? And uh, much like the Oracle of ancient Greece used to supposedly be able to do. Uh, and she tells Trinity that you'll know that, you know, that this person is the one because you will fall in love with them, right? And so she resists loving Neo until the very end when she's, when she's about to lose him, he's dead. And so what she whispers in his ear is, I love you, now get up. And that's when his heart starts beating. And that's when he gets up off the floor. And suddenly 
he is not that, he's not Mr. Anderson. He's not that kid who's questioning reality and questioning his, his role in this new reality that he's discovered. He's very much transcended and become the hero figure. And we know this because these agents that were kicking his butt throughout the entire movie try to, try to shoot him again, and he stops the bullets in midair, and, which surprises them. And then when Agent, Agent Smith, who's the villain in the movie, uh, comes up to him and tries to physically beat, beat him up again, uh, Neo easily holds him at bay, literally um, holds him at bay with one hand tied behind his back, right? And then goes on to do something no one's ever done before. He literally jumps inside of Agent Smith and destroys his code, literally explodes him from the inside out, okay? I'm gonna have to go watch that again. Yeah, all right. So who's the main guy in that movie? Do you remember? Um, who's the African-American guy? Uh, Lawrence Fishburne is the actor. And his character is Morpheus. Morpheus, yeah. And Morpheus is the one who's been searching for the one, right? Searching for Neo for years, right? And he is convinced that Mr. Anderson, Neo, is actually the one, even though Neo isn't, okay? Uh, and, and so his role is he starts to train Neo. Right? Not only in how to fight, right, and things like, you know, Kung Fu and Karate and all that fun stuff, but he teaches Neo about the nature of the Matrix. Right? And one of my favorite lines and scenes in that movie is, remember when they're in the dojo and they're fighting and he knocks Neo to the floor and Neo is breathless. He's like, ah, 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 ah. and Morpheus walks up and whispers in his ear and he says two things. He says, do you think that your body is actually what controls what happens in this place. Oh, that's cool. And then he pauses, and then he leans even closer and he says, do you actually think that's air that you're breathing? Oh, that's really cool. And that's, one of, that's the beginning of Neo's awakening when he realizes, yeah. And so they continue the fight and Neo suddenly is, is you know, 10, 20 times faster than Morpheus, right? Because once he understands the nature of the matrix, i.e., once he's telling himself a new story, has a new cognitive framework for how this fake reality works, he can suddenly manipulate it to the point that nobody else could before him, okay? Right, so, so that's one of the reasons why I love that movie, because it is a poster child for Joseph Campbell's, you know, hero's <laughs> journey, right, and that entire arc. Uh, and, and does so in almost like a literal sense, which is, you know, mind boggling. But, um, but all of that, you know, to say that uh, my role is the guide. Are I'm you Morpheus, Morpheus or Trinity? <laughs> well, well, I'm not going to kiss you so we can count Trinity. Though. <laughs> well, but, I'm, I'm, but I'm sort of a mix between no, Morpheus, Morpheus and, uh, and the Oracle, Oracle right? Because remember, yeah. the Oracle is, is another very important guy. And uh, do you remember that scene with the Oracle when Neo finally meets her yeah, for the first time? She's just, she doesn't look like an Oracle. I remember she was just like in her... her no, she's, she's this African-American woman yeah, in her mid-50s uh, who's a chain smoker, loves candy, and she's baking cookies in this kitchen in, in a ratty apartment that's probably in the projects in this fake reality, right? Um, and, you know, and when, and when Neo walks in, right? He's still not convinced he's the one, right? And so the Oracle, you know, most people would have expected the Oracle to say, you're wrong, you are the one, go save the universe, right? That's not what she does. What she does is the opposite. She holds his hands and says, so this is the part where I go, mm, yeah, you maybe might have potential, but you're really not the one. But don't worry, honey. Don't feel bad. Here, have a, have a cookie. <laughs> yeah. It'll make. And by the time you take, you know, you take your first bite of this cookie, you'll be feeling right as rain because all this pressure will come off your shoulders. Okay. And so Neo walks away. He walks into the elevator, 
As he's walking, he takes a bite of the cookie. He turns to Morpheus. And then before Morpheus, before he can say anything, Morpheus says, what you, you know, what she shared with you is between you and her. It's not meant for me. Right? And he suddenly feels better because this, this you know, think about it. He just woke up to the fact that he was living in a fake reality. And suddenly all these people are putting this huge burden of responsibility on his shoulders that he's not prepared for. And when you're in that situation, it freezes you up, right? It, it literally prevents you from actually being able to perform the way you need to perform to be the hero. And so the Oracle did a very smart thing. She agreed with him and said, take, you're not. How do we and took all that? that pressure off, right? Yeah. And, that, and that was one of the pivotal moments in, in his journey as a hero that enables him to become the hero, right? Because once that pressure's off, right, um, he can finally see what's important to him, right? And the sacrifices he has to make, right? And what's important to him is Trinity. He loves Trinity. And if, and if, and if he wants to continue loving her and having her continue live a life where they can both be in a life together, um, he has no choice but to become the hero so he can protect her, right? Beautiful. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like the Oracle and Morpheus because, um, you know, sometimes I tell you like it is, and that was Morpheus's approach, but also sometimes I tell you what you need to hear, right? Even if you don't want to hear it. Okay. Like, for example, when we were discussing your painting, right? Uh, the expression on your face when I said witches and how this was subversive, right? Uh, you know, as soon as the word witches came out of my mouth, or called uh, <laughs> and, right? And this notion, well, even before then, when I said, you know, that the subtext here was, you know, about witchcraft and how the church actually, you know, subdued the feminine, right? Um, as soon as that word witch came out of my mouth, the wall came down, right? You, and how many times did you say, I don't like that word witch, uh, right? That is you resisting becoming the hero. That is you believing narratives that are getting in the way of your own success, right? And you know what? The irony, uh, again, this is, a, this is an interview full of ironies, but the irony here is that, you know, the part of you that's ignoring all that is not your conscious brain. It's not your executive function. It's your subconscious. Your subconscious guided all of this, right? Your subconscious is what tapped into, uh, you know, you know Jung, Jungian's notion of universal symbolism, right? Uh, and, and, and it's what directed you to this composition and this arrangement of women, okay? And by the way, you mentioned the galactic center in the middle of your artwork, okay? Um, what is the actual galactic center, do you know? It's the do you know what actually lurks in the center of our galaxy? Well, it's the center of the Milky Way galaxy and it's just a black hole that just kind of- Not just a black hole, it is, one of the largest black holes known to exist, hmm. right? Every galaxy that we've, that we've been able to see through the Hubble telescope, including our own, at the center of it has this enormous black hole that is ravagely consuming all of the stars around it. But that's right? its role, it's, 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 and then, and it's a toroidal experience, but there's something called the super galactic center that you're probably aware of. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, what is it, the magnet, um, the great attractor is even bigger than that. So it's like, you know, it's Horton, here's a who. It, it's this. Yeah, well, well, here's, well, again, you know, we're talking about ironies and dichotomies here. Um, the literal center of the galaxy is this voracious bat coal that's eating up stars, killing them essentially, right? Consuming them. But at, but at the same time that it's consuming light, consuming potential life. It's also enabling many, many more lives, many, many more lights to exist, right? Because if it wasn't there, um, 
our spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy and all the other spiral arms and all the stars that are further away from the galactic center would have simply floated off into space, uh, into vast darkness, uh, never knowing that each other existed and uh, would have eventually burned out and died without knowing its place in the universe. Right? That's interesting, because if you look at the hermetic wisdom of as above, so below, as within, so without, this idea that maybe we too, each of us has our own black hole or um, galactic center within us, because I think that's what science and spirituality are really starting to mesh with. It's not just outside of ourselves, but it's actually part, we're part of that whole matrix. There's that word matrix of it all. I mean, there's so many matrices, but it's like, I think you nailed it. It's so funny how you can talk very many different um, pots and, and bells and whistles, and I love it. And you, yes. Yeah, no, well, well he, here's, the, here, here's the thing. And again, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll conclude here because yes. you know, obviously we were both- <laughs> a <determined>. marathon. <laughs> yeah, this is a marathon, but um, uh, you're right. We all do have a galactic center that both devours us and drives us. Uh, and you know what that is? Your artist's why, your origin story. Oh, you nailed it. The seven mm -hmm. whys. It's in like the seven layers of hell. <laughs> Dante's Inferno. No. You, know, you, know that, you know where that actually, why? you know where that methodology why? actually comes from? <laughs> actually, it comes from uh, something called lean manufacturing. Have you ever heard of lean manufacturing? I have, but I don't remember what it is. But okay, you know, so, so lean manufacturing was an approach to, uh, to industrial manufacturing that was uh, conceived of by the Japanese, right? Uh, and, and the reason the Japanese invented it was because after World War II, right, uh, Japan was trying to rebuild its economy. And unlike the United States, a lot of its infrastructure, its factories, its machinery has, had been destroyed in the war, okay? Uh, and, and so they were beginning to build up their economy again, beginning to build things like cars. And there was a gentleman that would go on to be the founder of, of you know, Datsun, uh, which later on became Nissan, uh, who, uh, who came up with this approach, right? Because at, you know, realistically, man car manufacturers in Japan could not compete with GM and Chrysler and Ford here in the United States the same way, right? They couldn't build huge factories with long assembly lines where they would spit out the same sort of sets of cars uh, in huge quantities, okay? But what they could do, right? So they couldn't compete on volume, but what they could do was they could compete on quality. And the reason they could compete on quality was because there was a lack of resources. Their manufacturing process was different. And if you think of like a traditional automotive manufacturing process, the way it works is you design, you spend years and years and years designing a car. Then you spend even more years creating all the machinery to make all the, all the parts of the car and then setting them up in the right order on the manufacturing line, right? And then the trick is to manufacture as many as you can, as quickly as you can, so that you make up all those capital investment, those upfront costs, in volume, in the volume of sales that you do, okay? Now, the problem with that approach is that if there's a design flaw in the vehicle, it's impossible to fix it, okay? Uh, and that's why you, we have this notion of like a lemon, right? A lemon is a car that had a design flaw in it that was mass produced, and it's literally better for the manufacturer to just stop producing the car than it is to fix the flaw and then set the whole manufacturing process because those, the, those pieces of equipment that they make to make cars at volume are huge and expensive, okay? So the Japanese had developed a different approach where they had smaller machines that could be retooled to create different parts quickly, okay? Now the beauty, the problem with that approach is you can't you create cars in the same, at, you know, at the same scale and at the same volume. But what you can do is you can improve the quality of those vehicles because making changes to the machinery to remove defects is incredibly easier. 
okay? And so that's how they started to compete with manufacturers in the US, the first Japanese cars. It was all about utility and reliability. And, and the funny thing, and, and so along with that, the guy who started, you know, Datsun and that became Nissan, um, uh, the story goes that he was, um, you know, sitting with his management team uh, and they were talking about a defect. It was a part that was coming off the assembly line that had a section to it that needed to be smooth, but, but was coming up rough. It was sort of like a, our ball and socket joint in our, in our joints. And the socket part of the assembly was, uh, had all these imperfections in it that was causing the ball part of the joint to erode, which was leading to accidents. And, uh, and so he assembled his management team and said, go figure out what the problem is. And so they went out, uh, you know, they talked to the people that worked, you know, on the line. Uh, and they concluded that the problem was that um, no one had changed the oil in the machinery. Oh, my goodness. Right. And because of that, there was all this buildup in the machinery. Uh, and, you know, and so that's, that's where the flaw was coming from. And so they thought they fixed it. And he went, nope, not good enough. Why was there debris in the oil? Very good. And so, so, and so they had to go back out again. So the and what they found was that a filter that was used to filter the oil had never been replaced since the machinery was installed. That's remarkable. And so they changed the filter and they said, oh yeah, we figured out what the problem was. Um, there's this filter that we never changed, so we changed it. Wow. And he went, no, yeah. why didn't we change the filter? And so they had to go back and figure out, you know, why they didn't change the filter. And it turned out that the guy who maintained the machine had never been trained, you know, to change the filter, let alone that the filter existed. Awesome. And so they went back and they said, okay, we took care of it. We trained the guy. And he went, okay. not good enough. <laughs> why wasn't he trained? So and so they that. went back and explored that, yeah. right? And what they realized is the reason that he hadn't been trained on it, the reason nobody knew about the filter was because the team that created the training documentation were that team of managers who had no direct experience with the machinery. They were going off with little documentation the manufacturer provided them with, right? Mm -hmm. And so they came back and his kid, we figured it out. The reason was that, you know, you know, we didn't have that in the training material and that's why he didn't know about it. Wow. And so we fixed it. And the guy said, not good enough. Wow. Why wasn't it in the training material? <laughs> and at this point, they're like pissed, right? I mean, they're like totally ticked off. They can't believe he's telling them to do this again, but they go back and they do it. And here's what they concluded. They concluded that the reason why it wasn't in the training material was because they hadn't included any of the people that actually worked with the machinery and knew the machinery better than they did. Wow. And so they changed their whole training and documentation process to make sure that it primarily consisted of the people who maintained the machine. That's and then a funny thing happened, right? Not only did that defect get resolved, but there were hundreds of other issues with the vehicles Oh. that were all magically fixed by just making that one change. One little tweak. Well, I love one the guy tweak. who kept saying not good enough. Yeah, oh. yeah. And so that's the reason why it's called the seven whys, because he literally went back to this team and said, why seven times till they got, and, and, uh, and scientists, right, and people that do this kind of thing, they call that root cause analysis. It's when you go, you know, you keep asking questions till you get to the ultimate underlying root cause of all these other effects that you're seeing. Wow. Because once you do that and you fix that, that fix trickles down, not only to the thing you were originally trying to fix, but to everything else that was wrong that was affected by that root cause. Okay? And that is the heart and soul of lean manufacturing. Uh, it just happens that that same technique works wonderfully well to get you to your artist's why. Oh, 
Thank you. Yeah. Well, so anyway, <laughs> you're exhausted. I'm exhausted. I know. But guess what? You know what? Anyone who stayed the course to listen to this, there are pearls. And I think, um, Dave, all I can say is thank you, thank you, thank you, because mm -hmm. you give so freely of these pearls that you've picked up. But when you string them together, there is a method to the magic of how to inspire artists to consider stepping beyond you know the limit the limiting thoughts and sharing their stories and their art with an audience that could really be inspired and encouraged and maybe even create another little domino effect of more amazing things so i want to thank you for joining me no it's it's been my pleasure and i think uh and we'll definitely do this again because I enjoy doing these with you. Oh, thank you. Um, and I think next time we should focus on what the formula actually is. Yeah. And, and what that 20% is. <laughs> yeah, the 80-20. Right. So I'll yeah, because I, I think that's what every, everybody's probably wondering, right? It's like, okay, right, we're talking right. about this that's formula. Right. What, what the heck is it? Well, we'll stay so. tuned with your free classes online and your newsletter. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll try and get this up because this coming Wednesday, the 22nd of June, that's when you're going to be offering that special, that special secret for anyone who wants to um, consider joining FASO. Did oh, I say FASO? Thank, thank you, Ursula. As always, you've been oh. amazing and patient. Have a wonderful rest of the week, my friend. Okay. Till next time. Bye, Dave. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Okay, well, my poor dog. <laughs> you poor thing. I know. I'm sorry. She had water. But you gotta, you gotta, you know. I go with the flow. I mean. Well, at, at a certain point, because I am like the Energizer Bunny when it comes to talking about these things. <laughs> I, I will you wind keep talking you and making connections <laughs> and uh, because I, I enjoy it. I enjoy helping artists. It's one of, it's one of the joys of my life. Next to my family, oh. um, th this is what inspires me and drives me to wake up every morning and do what I do. Um, so your job, and I know it's a hard job because I've had it too, is you got to rein me in. <laughs> so at a certain, yeah, you got to rein me in. So at a certain point, it is perfectly okay for you to say, you, you know what, Dave, uh, we've got so much more ground we can cover. We're going to save it for next time. And then we'll just cut it. But you know what? Okay. I'm feeling I know how to like edit now, so I might be able to splice. Because I figure, oh. hey, I'm so thankful I've got your, your your time. And oh, those questions. Um, so I'll go back and look at where I'm at with my optimization. I thought I was done. <laughs> Maybe I am. Oh, no, oh, no. Okay. Go, go back and take a look at my last uh, email okay. to you, because I think. Well, let me do this. Let me um. Let me take a look at your site really quick, if you'll bear with me. Okay, while you do that, I'm going to let the poor puppy come, come back. Yeah, poor, poor let, let the poor puppy kind of go. Good girl. Good girl. Okay, everything's okay? Everything's fine. So funny. Okay, I know. Okay, so, so here, here are two things that you need to do. Okay. okay, because uh, unbeknownst to you, you're you're sort of breaking one of the very important rules when it comes to your slideshow. Okay. okay. Um, too many images. Well, first of all, um, yeah, too many images. I mean, I mean, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Make it uh, five. Seven, seven's like you know, like the cutoff point, but you want to try to keep it to five. Okay. The other thing that you need to do is you need to make those all about your art. Okay, so no, no face. No, so okay. no pictures of you there. Okay. 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 The pictures of you come on your, you know, on your artist bio page, right? Okay. That's where we want, you know, pictures okay. of you. Okay. 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 And, uh, one of, and one of the reasons, you know, for that is because again, going back to Joseph Campbell, um, who's the hero of the story? The art. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's gonna live and there's also and there's also a practical reason for it too, right? Um, if you when you introduce a non-artwork image into a slideshow, mm -hmm. it doesn't link to anything. Okay, so I got. Okay. It. So, so basically, you have an image up there that people expect that they can click on, and it's going to take them somewhere. 
but it doesn't do anything. Okay. Right? So okay. you're introducing sort of, um, you're introducing fear and doubt into your visitor's mind because okay. it's, your website's not behaving the way that they expect and you don't want to do it. I know how to fix it. I know you do. And the, the next thing is that, um, you know, I don't think I got your artwork stories, which is sort oh, of the last. I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Was there any? Yeah, and, and that's fine because we've been kind of all over yeah. the map doing, doing crazy it, stuff. But the last, the last thing that we ended up working on was your artist bio, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so, um, and so we've got all of that sort of covered now. The next thing uh, I need from you, because remember, um, you know, one of the things we're going to do at the end of this whole thing, when I go, here you go, okay, is I'm going to sit down with you for about half an hour, and I'm going to just walk you through what you should be doing every month, okay, right, to keep the, the, the website fresh and interesting for repeat visitors, okay, much like a gallery rotates inventory in and out, okay, okay? now, um, so uh, when, we, when we do these optimizations, I tell you to pick five images for your slideshow, right? That show the breadth of what you have available. Okay. Uh, and also uh, organized in a way that the thing that you you want to, that either you're, you're, you imagine your collectors want to buy the most or you want to sell the most okay. are shown first, okay. right? Okay. Uh, and, uh, and, and when you're selecting pieces for that, right? Um, what you want to do is, is uh, use the most expensive pieces that you're currently presenting in your collection, okay. right? Lead with the most expensive piece. Okay. okay. And so that's what we should have done with your slideshow at this point. Like, okay. In theory, these should be your most expensive pieces, but go and check that out. And if that's not the case, well, here's replace the any of them. The problem mm -hmm. was that the focal part would cut off like the top and bottom because it was centered. So how do you? Yeah. So so down? here's so here's the trick. Okay, um, there 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 basically is one of two things. You know, actually one of three things that you need to decide on doing. Okay, uh, if you want to maintain this like really immersive experience that we're creating on your homepage by having it full page width, then you have to do one of two things. Um, you either have to pick. Um, artwork that is um, all landscape oriented, mm -hmm. or it's perfectly fine to mix landscape and portrait oriented pieces, mm -hmm. right? But the focal areas for each of those, you know, for those works need to either be the same or, or contiguous next to each other, right? So remember I told, explained how you uh, basically you separate, you create you imagine these three sections going vertically or, or horizontally stacked on top of each other, top, middle, bottom. And you ask yourself, okay, where's the focus of the piece? Is it in the middle, the top, or at the bottom? Okay. And if it's, and if it's, you know, and as long as the artworks in your slideshow are either in the same, you know, have the same, in the same section in terms of where the area of focus is, or next to each other, you're fine, okay. okay? Where you get into trouble is when, for example, you're mixing and matching uh, horizontal and vertically oriented artworks where the one piece has the focus at the top and the other one has the focus at the bottom. Okay. Okay. I think I can figure it out. And, and then depending on, you know, which of those uh, contiguous areas, you know, you've chosen, right? So for example, let's say that, um, you decide that you want uh, you know, the pieces that you've selected um, have their focus either all in the middle or all, or all in the top. Then what you want when you're setting up the slideshow, you want to set the alignment to top. Okay, okay? I, I, know, I saw that. If part. you find if you find that that the area of focus is in the middle or the bottom, you want to set the alignment of the slideshow images to to the middle. Okay. Okay, and that way you're guaranteed that the focus is always going to be there, right? Um, regardless of the orientation of the artwork. So that's one approach. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I'll I'll pick the images. Uh, now, a second approach, which unfortunately 
moves away from like this really cool immersive experience is that instead of doing a cover, the cover option, mm -hmm. which with this template creates this like full screen with image, you can move to uh, a contains okay. setting on your slideshow. But you now, like when you do that. that, what's going to happen is it's going to um, contain the artwork images within the you know the boundaries of the of the page the margins of the page so to speak right okay. so the image is basically going to going to be you know you know going to start at you know the beginning of your of your website's you know title right and then end at the end of that you know join my email list right like that's the margin right that's the contain area um, and so it won't be like this full page immersive thing um, but the, the benefits of doing contains is that um, it will show the entire artwork regardless of whether it's horizontal or vertical. Okay. Right? Because it's contained within the page, okay. it's going to actually scale the images in such a way that when people see it, they see the entire images no matter what the orientation is. And I can find and that, that. And that all of that imagery shows up above the fold of your website. Okay. Okay. Well, I have a question. So do you have a boilerplate question email that you can send me about the five pieces of art? Is there? Uh, oh, no, the only thing you need to do is, so how many collections did we end up with for you? One, two, three, four, five, right? Okay. Yeah. So pick one artwork from each collection. Okay. Okay. And, um, and pick the most expensive piece in each of those collections. Okay. And add them to your slideshow. Okay. And then create, you know, a story for the first one. Okay. Because what we're going to do is we're going to do, we're going to work on the first one together. Okay. Um, so that, you know, you can, you know, I can begin to learn your writing style and sort of the story of the piece. And then you can begin to see sort of the guidance I'm giving you. Right. Okay. Uh, and then I'll have you do the next four in one shot, but then we'll have a feel, right, for, for, you know, for how this whole process of you writing the story and then me editing it works. How long okay? should it be, Dave? So just a paragraph? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so <laughs> here, here's, here's sort of my suggestion, okay? Um, the, the answer that might seem coy but really isn't, is that it needs to be as long as you need it to be in order to tell the story. Okay. That okay. Now, if you can do that in three or four or five paragraphs, great. Okay. Um, but if the story takes longer to tell, okay, take as long as you need. Because what matters most is telling the story. That gets okay. And remember, good storytelling, you know, has all the, the, the components of a great narrative, right? Beginning, middle. Um, beginning, a middle, and an end, right? A hero, which in this case is the artwork, right? Because you're telling its story. Mm -hmm. uh, your role is as the guide, right? Uh, if you want to think about it in these terms, the artist is the guide that turns the vision and the concept into a, you know, a piece of physical art, right? So as the artist, you want to get into the feminine, um, you are the mother and the womb for this artwork that you're creating. And in the act of creation, you are nurturing it, just like a mother nurtures a child in the womb. And when you do things like varnish the painting, right? Um, you're nursing the black hole. <laughs> yeah, no, you're not the black hole. I mean, we no, all I are the black center hole. In a certain way, that's the pure yeah. potential of everything. It is the cosmic womb, didn't you know? So, okay. Yeah, I got, it, I got it, my... it, 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 it is. But, but those are the next steps. And so just, okay. do, just, so just do that. Do the first one right. and then send it over to me. I will. Um, and we're, we're literally coming towards the end of the process. 
right? Right. Because yeah. um, after we've finalized these artwork stories, um, the last thing on my list of things to do for you is to, um, you know, is to uh, set you up with a, with a, a, a one-to-many email template you can use. Yeah. That's, that's already got all of the design and personalization elements in it for you so that when you create a newsletter, you can just hit the ground running and create it. I was going to ask you, you know, um, that newsletter, I'm really having fun doing these little short videos um, on YouTube. And I'm thinking I could do the newsletter because nobody's reading anymore. You know, just here, click this if you want to see the latest. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, do, do people read anymore? No? Yeah. They do? Okay. Of course okay. they do. I just haven't gotten a newsletter together yet. So, you know, it's one step. Yeah. So, so here's, so, so but, uh, you know, again, this is sort of, um, you know, why I put this, uh, and again, we don't use the term newsletter, okay? Okay. Because newsletter means bed, bath, and beyond coupon in your okay. email inbox, right? Um, there's a reason why we call it a one-to-many email, because uh, your one-to-many email to an individual subscriber <laughs> to your newsletter list, uh, when properly written, is going to feel to them as if you were writing to them personally. Okay, that's a different. Thank you. Right. That's better. And that is different. And that's and it's and it's and if you want an example, um, think about all the invitation emails that you get from me. Yeah. For the courses, right? Yeah. yeah. They very sound like they sound like I'm writing them specifically to you, right? Yeah. Does Faso have a way where you you design it so you could put dear and then it puts in their name, or it we're not there yet? Uh. People like to see their name. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Uh, I, I wait until I create this little template for you. Okay. okay? Uh, and, and, and then, um, and the thing about it though, that you need to be aware of is that the template I'm gonna create for you uses our uh, newer email editor, right? So the one that you're, pro the one that you're probably using now is- um, I'm not using you one. Know, I don't oh, have you're not using one. Okay, okay, so this will be good for you. But we actually have two email editors. One is our classic email editor that our artists have been using for years. Okay. Uh, but we also created this other one uh, that, um, that also has a drag and drop interface. Right? Oh, I like the reason, that. But the reason that I like it is because, um, you know, it, it's free from some of the legacy approaches that we used to use with newsletters. So back in the day, back when like blogs were all the rage and whatever, right? Um, the current thinking at the time was that you wanted your email to look like your website, right? Branding, okay? What we learned very quickly was that when you make your newsletter look like your website and not look like just a normal email that you get from somebody, um, people react to it like they react to any other promotional email. Yeah. They ignore it. Not personal enough. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Got it? Uh, and <laughs> even if you personalize it, the fact that there are all these like background colors and a banner at the top and all this other stuff going on, it registers on the brain like you're trying to sell me something. Yeah, I don't have time for this. It looks promotional, yeah. Okay, it looks promotional, okay? So this new email editor um, literally you know, it doesn't have any of that in it, right? I mean, you can add it if you wanted to add it, but it's actually designed, it, you know, before you add any elements to it, to actually look like an email. Let me see if like I can a regular that email. Quick. Here we go. So here's, um, I think I'm in, um, where, uh, he, yeah, so if you, if you click on the icon that says newsletter, okay, which drives me crazy. Okay, okay. artful man. Uh, and then, and then you say new, new, uh, new new newsletter. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. 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 Click on. Okay, it's taking a while. I got a slow. <laughs> okay, yeah, so which one? You've got to work on your. You've got to work on your interwebs. Well, okay? well, we're out now. Scroll to the scroll to the top again because you kind of scrolled down. Okay. Click on use the advanced newsletter editor. Okay. See that? No, this is going to be really helpful. Okay, I clicked on it. It's okay. thinking. It sucked. Yeah. Your internet is really slow, but that's okay. It's unstable. Yeah, I've got... Yeah, we're, we're, um, 
Here. So, so where do you live again? Like what part of the country? Um, I'm in near Santa Cruz, but I'm out by Martinelli apple trees. <laughs> you know, the apple juice? Oh. I'm by the apple juice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, my, and my teenager just gotcha. came home, so she's using some of the Wi-Fi now, I'm sure. So, okay. Dang, dang. You know yeah. what I mean. So one, one, one piece of advice to you is if you're going to do this, um, these interviewing and the YouTube videos, you're going to want to increase your bandwidth with your provider. Well, well I we've... <laughs> That's a long story, but yeah, uh, what it is is I'm connected in my router to the computer, so I'm I'm plugged in, and we got an Apple network link, but that's about the with AT and T out here. So so anyway, anyway next uh, there may be some limitations, but yeah. but anyway, um, is this the and and this thing is still loading, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah so that's why I do the pre-records, Dave, because it's like I can't trust. I go, I was on Streamyard. No, no, I dropped Streamyard. I didn't have to. Speak. Here, let, let, let's do this. I'm gonna. Do you uh, do you mind not screen sharing for a sec? Sure, let me stop. And you're enabled. Cool. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't actually. I like this side by side fashion, by the way. So thank you, because you're welcome. It was my it was my pleasure. Just bear with me here for a second, because I gotta. I have three screens going on here, and I've got to figure out where the heck my mouse went. You're looking at that cauldron <laughs> a little bit differently now. That's so funny. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, you know what that's called? That's called uh, realigning your cognitive framework. Yeah, so you're cool. literally, as we're chatting here, Didn't even um, see it. Did your not. brain is rewiring itself uh, to view the world through this new cognitive framework of what I just described to you. Right. And, and it's a, and it's sort of like, a, it's like, it's like slowly sinking into a hot bath. Mm -hmm. right. It's not something that happens um, instantaneously. It's yeah. a, it's sort of a slow awakening, if you will. Well, while you're but looking for that, second. I would just echo um, I'm that. Almost, I'm almost, what the heck is going on here? This is crazy. Okay. While you're doing that, I'm just going to say you did a great mm -hmm. job with helping me sort that out because yeah, I, I was like a tomboy. I'd play tennis ball, handball. I thought I was equal to the guys until you reach a certain point. And I just was so upset. And my dad, you know, loved my dad until I kept be beating him in ping pong. And that was a marker as far as like, you know, my mom saying, you should make him happy. Why don't you ever learn? Let him win. I'm like, what are you crazy? You know, like, yeah. anyway, yeah. here we go. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Here's well, it, it, exactly. Exactly. And here's the irony. Your dad probably loved that about you. Yeah. Well, well, right? well he thought he was uh, a role your, your mom, on the other hand, it, it ran counter to Her culture. the way she believed a young woman should behave and act, right? All right. So here we are in the FASO control panel. Okay. okay. So when you go in, and this is my demo account. Yep. Look how fast yours remember. is. Yep. Boom. So we go here, we go to new, we go to new, new newsletter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then I'll have the same options. We'll say use advanced newsletter editor. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then when you do, you're gonna get to, to this template uh, to this page, which looks a lot like the 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 old editor, right? Like there's different templates that you can select. And um, and what you're gonna do is you're you know, um, well, let me put it this way. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the blank template to actually uh, create uh, uh, you know, uh, a newsletter template for you, okay? okay? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna send it to yourself. So you're gonna be the only person that you're gonna send this to. So you're gonna create, a, a, you know, a, a segment. Okay. That's just you, so that it becomes a past newsletter. Okay. And at that point, see that tab that says copy past newsletter? Mm -hmm. You'll be able to copy it to create your next newsletter or your one-to-many email. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, and so when you go into this... Uh, oh. Oh, break. <laughs> you got to increase your bandwidth. No, it's not <laughs> bad. It's... It, <laughs> I'm it's, just it, You know what? Sometimes... Um, Gremlin. Especially when, you know, Faso does this thing sometimes when you're inactive, where it's like, oh. you know... Okay, okay, I'm gonna mess with you. But whenever, whenever, if you ever get into that situation, if you just refresh the page, you'll see it all kind of clears up. 
Okay. Right. And so here you have sort of a drag and drop editor okay. where you can add all sorts of things, right? And uh, and one of the, you know, and, and, and I'm not going to get into all the no. crazy bells and whistles you can do because you don't really need them for, I know how to figure know, for our for our approach. But what you uh, but what you do is you come in here and for example, uh, you you know you want to add some text, right? Uh, and so you just drag and drop text over here, okay? Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then you start typing. And so in my case, and when you start typing and you're in the box, you'll get this formatting bar that'll follow you along as you're typing, okay? And so I'm just going to write a newsletter where I'm going to say hi. And then the way you insert a first name is uh, square bracket, all capitals, all together, first name, close the square brackets. And then and if you have a first name for the subscriber, it'll insert it. Okay? Now how did you and then from there, where did you, you get the from bracket? There you just keep, pardon me? Is the bracket on your keyboard? How'd you yeah, buy that yeah. bracket? Uh, the bracket is located, are you on a Mac as well? No. No? Okay. So I don't know where it is on a Windows keyboard. It's usually over to the right above um, like the shift key. You'll see there are a couple of keys there, one for curly brackets and one for square brackets. Okay. I will find it. I didn't know okay. I had a bracket. Here's another way that you can do it is, um, here, I'm going to get rid of this here for a second. Right. And so if you ever forget okay. this, you see this little button here that says merge tags. Mm -hmm. If you click on merge tags, the only option in here is recipient's name. Okay. And if you select that, oh, it'll, it, it'll, it'll pop it in there for you. Okay. Awesome. Although awesome. why it's popping in name and not first name, I don't know. That's one of the questions I'll need to ask the developers, life. right? Yeah. Uh, it could be that this template or this uh, editor works a little bit differently. And so it uses name to pop in the recipient's name. Okay. Uh, but I will check that out for you just to make sure. Okay. okay. Uh, and then you literally just begin typing. Right, and so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you add uh, an extra, you know, space, you know, line in between each paragraph, and um, you know, and and uh, and at the very end of this, right. So basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create uh, a template for you that's going to have this. Okay, it'll have some copy in here that sort of explains like instructions, right. Uh, you know, we're in tips around like, you know, narrative structure. So here's okay. the beginning of your story. Here's the middle. Here's the end. Um, I'll also be including things like a call to action button for you. So you don't have to create one yourself. But if you I wanted to, that. it's super, it's new? super easy. You were, you um, asked that new button thing. I love that. Yeah. Well, you, everyone was well, having trouble with the HTML. It's like, um, yeah, button. yeah, yeah. So we did that. But uh, in the, in this advanced email newsletter, if you, uh, when you're in a box like this, mm -hmm. right, um, it's showing you the pro the properties of the content that you're currently working on. Okay. Okay. All right. And uh, and so if you want to get back to something like a button, what you do is you click on the content tab again, mm -hmm. right? And you'll notice that suddenly I get all those options, one of which is a button, right? Yep. And so what you do is you take the button and you drag it below the text that you wrote. Okay. Right. And then all you do is you, like, let's say the call to action was, um, you know, uh, I'm just making stuff up here, but watch my latest video. Right. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and then the only other thing uh, that you need to do here is, uh, and I got to figure out which, uh, where, where it is. Oh, it's over here on the side. You see where it says URL? Yep. You just put in the link to wherever you want the button to take somebody. So okay. I can go to my YouTube. So if this was watch my latest video, it would be, you know, link to your YouTube page. Wait, okay. this is great. All right, that'll right. make And there's a whole bunch of other options here, but these are sort of like the basics. And then the other thing I'm going to add for you, um, right, because uh, the thing about a button is its own content area, right? And so whenever you insert a button, right, um, you, you, and, and you're going to want to continue with some additional text, you'll have to come back into content, go over to text again, and add another text block below the button. I see. Right? 
so that you can continue with content. Okay. Yeah. And so, and so here, so here there may be some other stuff, right? But, um, but at the, but, the, but at the very end, what I'll do is I'll add a signature. And I think, what did we pick for you? Do you remember what the signature was from your website? Off the top of your head, actually, I have it right here. I think. Uh, uh, it's with deepest gratitude, Ursula O'Farrell, right? Okay. Uh, and so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy sort of the, the closing part, right? Okay. And, uh, and when I do that, fortunately, I got, a, I got the zoom window that's sort of in my way. Okay. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I then want to pick a content area, but this time I'm going to pick an image, right? Great. I'm going to drag it there. And then, uh, and then I'm going to browse, browse for images and guess what I'm looking for? Okay. Not looking for my headshot. <laughs> I'm looking for your headshot, which is here somewhere. Here's a manatee. Okay. Well, but I, I, guess. I, I love manatees. Manatees oh, are some God. of my favorite ma tees. Oh. I like t-shirts and manatees. And oh, I'm sorry, this is my website. So not your website. So basically, <laughs> On your website, just like on my demo site, you're going to have a headshot, right? Yeah. That we put that we, you know, that we decided to use. So we're going to add it, and then we're just going to do a little formatting to it. We're going to align it left, right? Because emails are always aligned left. Uh, and then um, you can actually, um, you know, adjust the size with this little slider, right? So we're going to adjust the. Well, come on now. I've got to, got to remember to deselect auto with. Um, you're going to want to just resize that to, you know, usually 20% is about where you need to take it. Okay. Right. Uh, and, uh, and you notice how the image doesn't line up with the text, right? That's because when you insert an image, it doesn't have a margin, a left margin like I the text see. does. Mm -hmm. And so the way that you fix that, because there's a whole bunch of properties over here, is you come, see where it says padding? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you click on more options. When you do, it lets you set different paddings across all the size of the images. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add some left padding to the image until it lines up with the text. See that? Would you ever use that padding for anything other than an image or um, what else would no, you use? Usually it's just for uh, an image. You might use it for a button sometimes if you want to provide some extra spacing between text and, and a button, right? Great. Um, and, and then the, the final step in the process of creating the signatures, we have to come over here, uh, add another text section, right? And, and then we just add our signature, right? So this is... For me, it would be Dave Gita, CEO, the arts marketer, and, uh, and this is a mouthful, chief platform <laughs> evangelist. <laughs> how how okay. often would you recommend newsletters going out? Like once a month, once a quarter? The minimum is once a month. Okay. Okay, any less than that? And you lose sales, yeah. right? Because yeah. people people lose lose touch. And most ideally, of my ideally, if you can if you can sustain it, the optimal amount is once a week. Now, does does Faso have or Faso have a place where people say, "Hey, unsubscribe me. I don't want to get your your ridiculous newsletter." Um, um, yeah, it, it's in there when you get the email. Oh, okay. If you look at the footer of I don't have any, to do anything though, right? No, no, no. It's automatically sort of put in there for you. So there's oh, nothing awesome. that you need to do. Okay. But um, you know, but here we go. I've got my text here. The uh, the only other thing that looks kind of a little bit goofy is uh, you know, when I created this text box for whatever reason, it set it to uh, okay. 12 points. Yeah. Right. So I'm just gonna make sure it's 14 point so it matches. And you can set the font size to any size you want. Anything, you know, around 12 or to 14, you know, picks, you know, point size font would work fine. Um, and, and then if, and then as part of your signature, if you wanted to, for example, 
add a link, like I have a link in my signature, you can just select the text and then click on the link button in the formatter here, okay? Uh, and when you do, you can, um, you know, you can put in the URL, hit okay, and then this will turn into, into links in your signature. Okay. So that URL is to your website, right? That URL could, in my case, would be, this one would be to the art marketer and this one yeah. would be to Faso. I see. In okay. your case, you know, you could have, you, you know, you could have two links. You can have one that's linked to your website. Right. And you can have another one that's linked to your YouTube channel. Great. Okay. Well, this right. is really, this is a very interact. This is, this is nice. It's, it's not. So, so when you and I are, you know, are, you know, have that final, like, yeah. final meeting together where I'm doing the handoff, yeah. this is kind of the stuff that we're going to do. Yeah. Okay. Right. Like I'm going to be walking you through the mechanics of keeping your website optimized. And can I ask you, do I, if I have mm -hmm. um, emails in my AOL or Gmail, how do I get them into the FASO site? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward process. Um, so basically it's one of, you know, one of two ways of doing it, right? If you can get the emails into uh, a comma separated file, uh, then we can import a bunch of them all at once, right? Uh, if you can't for whatever reason or don't want to or whatever, um, the way that you do that, and I have to leave the page here because I don't, I don't need this. Um, so I can show you that. So we're going to go back to the newsletter uh, section. And you see there's a link here called subscribers. Mm -hmm. See that? If you click on subscribers, okay, you, uh, you know, you, you, you just see this little carrot here next to add subscribers, you either click on the button or click on the carrot. And when you do, you're gonna see two options pop up. One is add, you know, a single subscriber mm -hmm. or you can import a subscriber. Nice. And, 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 and I mean, subscribers, plural, right? Cause your, your comma separated file should obviously have a number of these folks in it that you wanna import, okay? If you add a single subscriber, it'll take you to the screen where you pop in the email address, their first name, their last name, the source, right? And, uh, and then you wanna make sure that you check off, this person gave me permission to be added to my email list. I see, oh, good point, okay, I might've missed And that. when you do that, um, it will then not send them the verification email. Okay. Right? Okay. Because what you're doing by checking that off is saying, I've already, gotten their permission some other way. So, so my YouTube channel is up to 308 subscribers. Um, that's awesome. But I don't have emails. So um, I guess I could make a plug, say if you want to be part of my newsletter, I could put a link to the newsletter from my YouTube. So how do I get a link from my to my newsletter uh, to share on YouTube? It's after I create- um, Yeah, sure. Um, so well, we could do it another time. I just, I was no, just, no, no, I'm so excited. No, I, that was literally, that was an honest to God, sure. Let me tell you, I got to tell you, it's growing so fast because I'm giving away free little mini readings. <laughs> so, uh, there you yeah. Go. Okay. Yeah. And so one of the things you always sort of have to ask yourself at the end of the day is, um, you know, you always have to ask yourself, what's in it for them? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So what's in it for them to sign up for your email list? Right. What do they get out of it that they would find valuable? Okay. And if the answer to that is, well, I'm going to let you know when a new video is available. That's not very valuable because all they have to do is subscribe to your YouTube channel, right? right. And they get notifications. And so, uh, and so what you typically want to want to do is um, you want to treat your newsletter content uh, as the most special place where you share the most special stuff, whatever that special stuff is, okay? And everything else, right? like social media, a YouTube channel, anything else that you do, uh, is where you build awareness and connection by giving away content, like you're giving away content, right? 
But then the incentive for them to sign up for your email list is like, could be for example, by signing up for my email list, you'll get, ex you'll get exclusive access to content that's not available on my YouTube site. Okay, I like that. It's very personal yeah. and private. More. It's very personal, but, but specific to what they're interested in, right? And so if you're getting a lot of traction with these videos around, um, what did you say? I forgot what you, you know, with the content. Read, reading. You're reading? Okay. Um, and, and just so I'm on the same page, what do you mean by reading? Um, I... I'm a galactic starseed astrologer. And so... Uh, and so you do astrology readings? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and, so, um, and so what you might do is you might, you know, in your, in your YouTube content, right, you might provide a mini version of a reading, right? And then tell people, if you want, you know, if you want the rest of the reading, right, sign up for my email list where I provide those every week oh, in their entirety. A little more content or a little With more, more content, right? More content, yeah. Okay. Uh, and the thing about a reading, right, is um, if you think about it, uh, um, a reading is essentially a story. It is right? It is. And so, uh, and so remember how we say that, you know, a story has a beginning and a middle and an end. And the, and, and the worst thing in the world is when you're missing out on one of those pieces. Yeah. Oh, that's especially, great. especially the end. Right? Yeah. Okay. Now I'm not saying that you do it this way. Right. But, um, by the way, um, Complete other side note. Uh, the, the reason I know about this stuff is because my, my mom was totally into astrology. Okay. I, I was not. I am still not. I don't believe it, but I respect other people's beliefs around it. Uh, but, but I had the advantage of having someone that was really kind of into it. Oh, and, okay. and also someone who couldn't help but share them with me all the time <laughs> right like she would she would you know she would read them out loud to me like telling your transits and, she, and your, and your well <laughs> yeah well and she would read and she knew everybody's astro astrological sign yeah and and so she would and and so she would start from disaster to good news <laughs> right and so tell she'd say okay bad. um uh i gotta tell you what's going to happen with, you know, c cousin Jose, right? <laughs> um, because he's got some, look, we, we need to rally around him because he's got some bad stuff coming his way. Oh, and, she'd read it, and then she, she'd read it to me, right? Is she the and Portuguese? if you notice, what was that? <laughs> is, was she Portuguese? Was, was she, no, was, my, was my, my, my mother was Cuban. Cuban, okay. <laughs> and both sides of my family come from Spain, okay? Right. Oh and my God. So, yeah, so it explains a lot of things. Uh, but anyway, um, and, and so if you look at the narrative structure of a reading, uh -huh. right, it, it's, it sort of starts out, you know, uh, like a fortune cookie, right? Like there's this <laughs> teaser at the beginning, right? <laughs> Where, you, you know, know. Yeah. And, and, and it's either success or disaster, right? Right. And then it goes into specifics, right? But in a very general way, right? Uh, sometimes using um, archaic sort of astrological terminology, but sometimes it's in, it's, in, it's in plain English and sometimes it's a mix of both, right? You know, they'll say, uh, you know, and I'm making this stuff up and it, may, and it may sound like baloney, right? But just to give you the feel, it'll say something like, you know, uh, Scorpios need to be on the watch this, this month because Taurus is on the rise. <laughs> so and that means, and that means dark days are ahead. Yeah, no. 
I and then the rest of it is sort of like, and I, look, I'm, I'm giving you the hackneyed version of like an astrological reading, right? But then the rest of it is sort of an explanation, uh, you know, and some general guidance, right? So it's sort of like, um, you know, it, 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 and it, it's, it's, it's sort of like a roadmap, uh, you know, that, that then explains what you mean by that, by that teaser line, right? <laughs> and then what you need to do about it. Right, in right. order to come to the proper outcome, and to be in alignment with, you know, with, you know, with the mechanics of astrology, right? Yeah, this is putting the fixed right. stars, so it's adding more narrative that's from a galactic perspective. Yeah, it's redefining. To totally, I know, totally, but I get totally, what you're saying. To totally, 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 totally. Like, but the like, structure like, is the same, it. right? It's sort of like. You know, it's sort of like a newsletter, I'm sorry, not a newsletter, a newspaper uh, uh, article, right? Yeah. Right? Uh, there's an expression in the newspaper, the newspaper land, where, you know, journalists are taught all the time not to bury the lead, right? And what that means is you got to take the nut of the story, whatever that is, and, uh, and that becomes the headline for your article, and it's written in a way that teases the story that you're about to tell, right? And teases it in a way that people can't help but want to read the story, right? So a poor way of reading it, of writing a, an article, would be to have an article that says, uh, Mayor's Dog Shot, right? And then you go in and you describe the facts about what happened. And then somewhere towards the bottom, usually, um, you know, there may be a component there that says police believe that the suspect is, um, you know, is a stalker who's been stalking the mayor for over 10 years um, and, uh, and is on more than several occasions threatened the mayor's life. Okay. That's called burying the lead. What right. should the lead for that article be? Yeah, stalker in the neighborhood. <laughs> Psycho kills mayor's dog. Yeah. Right? All right, I got you. I think got I'm running out of gasoline, though. This was great. Yeah, I'm going to let through. you go, but you as you're thinking about this content, what you want to do is just create yeah. teaser versions of it, right? Just practice. enough to get people excited and get some value from it. I'm going right? to practice but, with that. But then tell them, Right, you know, if you want, the, you know, if you want early access to these readings and the full story, sign up for my newsletter. Yeah, I got to do this. Or sign up for my part. email list. Yeah. Right. Okay. I gotta and then you create, and if you want to stick to videos, you create a full video version of it. Yeah. That they can only access through the newsletter. Well, the real, well, the real weaving, Dave, is this idea of the spirituality that I'm tracking along with the paintings. So, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's learning how to weave it. So I'm not separating them because it's, yeah, it's yeah. like, like you've got a whole different angle on this stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but again, we're talking about mechanics here and mechanics are mechanics. They're the same, no matter, you know, what your ultimate goal is. Yeah. Right. Um, exciting. You know, it's like money. Money is money. Right. Uh, and the way an artist should think about money is that it's just fuel energy yeah. there's nothing wrong with making money yeah. right money is just fuel that that you know that enables you to have the impact that you want to have on the world yeah right thank you and, thank li and live a, and live a comfortable life while you're doing it that's it yeah right? oh, i feel i feel really grateful that i got to go really deep this time and, and well both sessions with you so thank you like you said, go, next time we'll walk go. through the playbook if you want. And yeah, go get some rest, man. Hey, you too. All right. I am. I'm. I'm probably going to take the longest nap in history. But, uh, but, right. uh, but I'll keep her. an eye. I'll keep an eye out for that first story from you. Thank you. Okay. All right. We'll be coming. Right. Bye bye. Bye.